All right, we'll call the meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record this meeting is being recorded by Norcam and may be being recorded by other local media. We're also being recorded by Zoom by the town, we think, we hope. If you could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to take us a little bit out of order because I think the big the big issue on everybody's minds is trash and I wanted I asked the town administrator to give us an update contrary to what people might be understanding here the town administrator and other p people in the administration of the town have been in record number of conversations and contact with the company that's supposed to be doing our trash hauling we're not alone as a community in terms of what's going on, but I, I asked the town administrator to take things out of order to let the residents, if any, who are joining know and let all of us know we're all residents. Most of us are residents here too as well with trash out on our uh, front sidewalks as well. So to let all of us know what's going on with that and to just see what the update is with regard to what plan B is because obviously plan A isn't working out for us. So Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this will uh, substitute for my town administrator's report, so you don't need to come back to me later this evening. Um, that sounds good. <laughs> you're absolutely correct. Uh, we have been dealing with a, a very difficult challenge with regard to trash and recycling collection. And right off the bat, I'm just going to point out a couple of folks who people are going to recognize. The DPW director is here. Amy Duchara from the Department of Public Works Administrative Office. And uh, Jesse's not with us this evening, but they have been on the other end of many phone calls coming in from many residents and been involved in um, ongoing communication with Republic Services. Just to summarize, for those who don't know, um, this transition is rooted in Republic Services purchasing JRM, who is our longtime contracted trash and recycling contractor. Uh, we were never formally notified of the transfer. We were notified when they asked to meet with us to tell us that they wanted to change our collection schedule to which we responded, we did not want to make a change to the collection schedule at the point in time that it was brought up to us in the early part of the fall. Um, still awaiting formal notification. Um, and when we even, when they indicated to us that they thought it might be something in the long term, we said to them, give us a proposal. We would like to consider it. Still awaiting the proposal after being told it would be given to us in the end of August, beginning of September, and then again as recently as last week. In the meantime, the challenges have uh, snowballed um, most Notably, when JRM and Republic merged um, two weeks ago now began and began dispatching their trucks, not from the customary Peabody location, but from a facility that they have, uh, Republic has uh, in Tingsboro. Um, and since that occurred uh, now two weeks ago, um, we have seen missed pickups throughout town. Um, we have seen a lack of equipment or sufficient equipment being in town, a lack of personnel, reports of maybe one truck here in town or one truck with one person in it collecting trash or recycling. So let's think about that for a second. Truck drives, stops, driver gets out of the vehicle to collect the trash and dump it in and then gets back in and keeps driving. That's a true story. Um, very, very difficult experience with Republic Services. We have been in touch with them um, almost every day since this happened. Uh, with the exception, I think, being the Sundays when we're not able to be in touch with them. Um, very disappointed with the customer service. Uh, we multiple times have been directed to a, um, a nationwide call center that they have, uh, which we were told is open on Saturdays. Yet when we called on the first Saturday, it was closed until Monday. Um, we've all been frustrated with this. Um, I think none more than myself and the folks in the Department of Public Works who have been trying to handle this. Um, to make matters worse, w worse with the lack of resources, every time we try to course correct this and come up with a plan that would get the town collected in a short period of time, uh, Republic has failed to deliver. They've just not been able to give us the, um, the appropriate personnel and equipment here. You know, and we repeatedly hear it's an equipment failure, it's a personnel shortage. Um, we tried to rewrite the whole program in a matter of 48 hours at the end of last week and put out a five-day collection issued reverse 911s, probably the 10th that we've issued on this. And um, still today, they seem to not 
perform properly under the contract because we, we, we saw very little activity in the so-called Monday collection route um, and in fact saw the resources in other areas. Um, incredibly frustration, in, incredibly frustrating for me and I know for all of our residents who've got trash and recycling sitting in front of their home. Um, it's not much consolation, but we're not alone. Um, this is a problem that's being experienced by communities in our region who were previously serviced by JRM and who similarly were transferred off to this firm, uh, Republic Services, which is uh, a nationwide <clears throat> firm. Um, so a couple things that we've been doing um, over the past couple of days, we've, I already you know, indicated here, we've tried to work with them to adjust the routes to something that would uh, work for their operations and that, that's not worked, it's not been sufficient. Um, last week when we had properties that were going into two weeks of not being collected, we had public works crews who went out with town trucks and collected trash curbside uh, and brought it to available containers uh, at municipal buildings. Um, that's something that continued today and will continue tomorrow as well with a focus on those who did not have their trash collected at, at all last week or prior. We had a couple properties not collected since September 27th. Um, totally unacceptable in the performance of the, of the contractor. Um, which leads us to uh, what do we do moving forward? And so we are working with town council with regard to a formal notification of their failure to perform under the contracts. And that comes with it a period of time under the contract that they are offered the ability to correct their performance. Candidly, the DPW director and I do not expect that they will correct their performance. We don't see that much will change. Mm -hmm. So um, on a parallel course, not only are we asking our DPW crews who have been um, nothing but extremely helpful with going and collecting trash with, without the right equipment. We don't have a packer to go and, and throw the, the stuff in. We have to put it in a dump truck or in a, a flatbed of some sort and then move it by hand, which is what they've done. We're going to look to go to a, a more um, aggressive operation with a loader and a dump truck, bringing it to a, a, a dumpster that we're going to need to dump it into um, in order to store it before it can be taken away. Um, but we're looking at, at what our options are, you know, what other providers are out there. Um, we, we, while things were frustrating over the past year with JRM, um, we were able to get the town collected. Um, I think Republic, in addition to many failures, failed to recognize, though, that the past year was challenging with JRM. So it wasn't like this new company came in and they were able to just, um, they had a couple of failures in the first week. This was on top of 14 months worth of issues we had with JRM not finishing the town in a day. Um, so today, um, the, town, the, the DPW director and I are, um, have been in conversations with um, other carriers with regard to uh, their ability to come and, and, and help or replace uh, Republic Services here in the community. Um, I, I will tell you that in the conversations we're having, the indications are that there will be a cost implication with regard to this if we do look to go in that route. Um, there's also the fact that most of the available carriers out there are looking to go in the direction of automated collection. And while we don't have to make that decision today, it's something that they are going to be encouraging us to consider, and that has a cost to the tune of $100 a toter, and if you're talking about a trash and recycling toter, $200 a household, or somewhere around three quarters to $900,000. Um, so a significant potential impact um, that, you know, for us, maybe the only way we can get the trash collected in the community, and if that's the case, we're gonna have to consider it. But the DPW director, myself, the staff in the DPW, we are pursuing those options uh, with town council. Um, and we'll continue to keep the community updated. Um, we've sort of backed off the reverse 911s because we're communicating to the residents what Republic is communicating to us. And again, for probably the eighth or ninth time, what we've been told is not what happens. So the, inf the information is just not useful to communicate out. So to, I guess, summarize it for those who are at home right now, you know, wanting to know what should they do, I think that the best thing we can rec recommend to you is to have your trash and recycling curbside for collection if it's not been collected already from last week or if you're waiting for it to be collected for this week. Yes, we've been given a map and yes, we're going to direct them to that. But despite our instruction, they seem to not be able to follow that direction uh, and show up in other areas of town. And so to ensure you're not missed by a truck that's gone by, the best we can advise is to, uh, if possible, in a barrel, have your trash and recycling curbside for collection. Um, I'll stop and answer any questions, but the last thing I do want to add is um, our work has been focused on trash. That is the most immediate public health issue. There is a significant recycling 
performance issue that they've had. Most of the east side of town, um, from what I understand, not collected with recycling last week and significant pockets that have gone multiple weeks not collected. Um, we are trying to work to address that as well and that would be part of any, any solution. So I know I've offered a lot, maybe a little impassioned, I'm sorry, but very frustrating. Okay, questions? Uh, just, uh, I just got a text unsolicited by somebody who's not watching the meeting. <laughs> that they crashed and get picked up again. Yeah, uh, I've had lots of those. Yeah, so again, all of us are being, you know, and corralled somewhere or another, whether we're out in the community <laughs> or being called or emailed, and, you know, it's extremely unfortunate. And again, as the town administrator pointed out, you know, JRM, we had our issues with it, but, you know, absence makes the high grow fonder. Uh, this mm -hmm. is just, uh, and again, we saw this Republic apparently is having three, four weeks ago, Lawrence, Plastow, you know, again, took over these other other routes and other contracts and unable to, to meet the terms and conditions. So you know, they're, they're growing, but they're not servicing. It's extremely frustrating. And uh, as the town administrator said, just to reach out, contact, they have the, have your trash ready to be picked up. And again, if it doesn't contact the DPW, and again, the trash is more important than the recycling, obviously, from a public health standpoint. And um, you know, mine hasn't been picked up either. <laughs> Come along with everybody else. <coughs> been out there for yeah. be a week tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, totally unfortunate and irresponsible on their part. And uh, again, the, the cost associated with us changing mm -hmm. vendors and uh, is going to be significant because we have a four four years left to run on this contract. I believe so. Yes, which are pretty favorable terms in relation to the contract that we signed. But the contract's not worth anything if they're not going to run right. meet the terms and conditions. So. <clears throat> Terribly Madam, unfortunate. Madam Chair, may I just add a couple of things that you just reminded me? Yeah. You know, if you if you are going on, if you are, your trash is awaiting collection, particularly if it was not collected last week, you can reach the Department of Public Works at 978-357-5260. Um, we have staff there. They answer the phone to the extent that they can. Uh, we had hundreds of calls that came in on Sunday and Monday morning. Amy, as I look to you to verify. And, yeah, multiple, <laughs> multiple. Hundreds. It, it's just um, we. The way we try to conduct business is to return the call and provide information. And unfortunately, at that volume level, we're just not able to. I ask for your patience. Um, these, this contractor is not under the direct control of the town. It's not performing. But please convey, co please communicate with the Department of Public Works either by that phone number or by emailing trash at recycle. At, at, excuse me, trash at northreadingma.gov to provide your information. Um, I also just want to add, I'm particularly sensitive to the fact that those of us who are residents enjoying uh, or, or who are supposed to be enjoying trash collection and recycling collection, we're paying a fee for it. And, and we, I think we all at this table recognize that that is exacerbating a particularly difficult circumstance and, and that is not lost on us. And I, I've heard things such as, will we be able to issue a credit or things like that? Um, that's going to depend upon how things shake out between the town um, and, um, and the contractor with regard to the performance under the contract. Um, and unfortunately, it may be offset by the fact that we are probably looking at a, a change in the cost in any scenario, an increase um, in the event that we have <coughs> with a change. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right. We knew that that, I mean, trash is something that we talk about many hours and hours and meetings and meetings. And we knew that at some point that fee was going to increase once we shifted to a different carrier and a different method because of the rate that we had been granted for so many years from JRM and the ability to extend it to save save on that fee. Um, but uh, I do appreciate the responsiveness of the DPW. I know that it's a lot of extra work that's been done and we're not equipped to, we aren't equipped to haul trash. That's why we have an outside vendor who is supposed to be doing it for us. But we are definitely appreciative of, of those efforts. And just like Mr. Gilberto said, to just please be patient. And and if you, we we get the calls and we're forwarding them on or forwarding them to, to Mr. Gilberto. And we appreciate that residents are reaching out to us too. None of us have the correct vehicles to, to pick up people's trash. So that's not going to work out. But nor do we have the right licensing to do it. But we do appreciate the DPW and we're a resilient community. We just made it through a pandemic. We're gonna make it through these issues and we will make it through probably and hopefully to a better vendor 
to serve the community. We'll, we'll figure out the next plan, but I also do want to thank Mr. Gilberto and, and all the administration who's been working ardently on this and had to pivot to focus in on this because it is supremely important. It's extremely important for us that the, that this get taken care of. So it's unfortunate too that the amount of resources that are being devoted by by the administration of town hall yeah. to address something which was totally out of our control is again unfortunate and we greatly appreciate the the effort that's being put forward. But yes. The last week has just been on top of everything else that's going on. Yes. You know, had to deal with this. So it's yeah. Yes. Totally uh, unnecessary. I think Mr. Studo I might have a and, comment or two. And again, because when they come out later, people get a little bit more upset. It, to be clear, there will there is a solution to this, but it's going to cost. So meaning just, and again, I say it because sometimes it comes to a surprise when it happens, but it seems that, you know, communities are being, I don't want to, force is a strong word, but the because of the manpower and the labor, to have those uniform barrels. So eventually it's just something that I don't, I just want to be very forward that this is kind of what we talked about when we set the rates last year, that we really are fortunate because we're not being forced to look at another courier and we didn't know this was going to happen. So just something to be clear that, you know, besides the, you know, the, the fee, and we don't know what that will look like because we haven't had time to explore it, that there will be a cost associated to remedying this, long term because i agree that based on other communities who have been dealing with this a little longer than us it does not seem like republic can fix it just to be really honest you know sitting here and saying that you know we can rant on channel seven and it's going to be fixed it's just not it's not going to happen so that i just wanted to say that because it sometimes um you know, on social media, once you find a solution and say it's going to cost a little bit more, then that becomes a problem. So I just wanted to be very clear about it. Right. We were trying to do this in incremental steps because it's an issue that's been studied and a committee that's been working on it. We have the recycling committee and there's so much, so many smaller pieces of this that we've been trying to plan in, in advance for incremental steps. But this may propel it into a, you know, a more immediate direction. But Mr. Walner, just two things. One is, um, I'm just wondering because I heard, you know, people would call on the telephone or do the email. But should we post on our website right on the very front a daily notice about what's going on with the trash, just to kind of create a news update for people to find it as well, and that might save you, you know, 100 calls. I'm not sure, but let's try to do that. And the second thing is. If the DPW is already going around and picking up people's trash, you know, personally, if you said, because I haven't been picked up in two weeks, um, you know, we, we're going to open up a bin down at the DPW lot there. Come bring your trash down if you want to. I would do that. I think a lot of people would. And if all you're going to do is collect it there anyways, you know, people just want to just put it somewhere as opposed to it piling up in their house. I'm suggesting if you can set up the staging area for that, let's offer some relief from everybody. Let's let's take advantage of that, right? Because I would, you know, I used to do recycling down to the yard way back before there was yeah. pickup at the curb. So, you know, for some people, twenty five percent that might provide an answer. You know, while we're getting through, it's, the, it's not the town's fault per se. Just two suggestions. Matthew. Putting you on. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that I know I don't want to put you on the spot, but is that a possibility, Mr. Gilberto? Are you gonna... So it's something we've been discussing okay. you know, for trash or for recycling or for both, and okay. um, to to the point of, uh, you know, Mr. Walner's brought up with regard to communication, we have been putting information on the website, issuing um, email messages in addition to the reverse 911s and posting it on social media. I think the lesson learned that we have is that we're just going to communicate the message about what we're doing because we can't seem to be able to predict right. Right. what what Republic is going to do. And so can't more, you can't reconcile the, the message that they're giving us to what's actually happening. Yeah, so just so, even the advice is yeah. put your stuff out like now because you yeah. don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm left holding off till Friday because you suggested I'm left Friday now. I don't know if I'm going to hold off. Oh, I know. I, I'm left with no choice but yeah. to suggest that because we received calls this week today yeah. of folks who were told we we're going to be collected on one day because we were told by Republic that it would be co collected yeah, yeah. on that day. And instead, the truck came through and we don't know when it's going to be back. Right. So um, I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sort of forced to give that that recommendation to the community. 
uh, but we will look at the issue of making available a facility for drop off for trash or recycling or both um, and, and the availability of containers, which we think that, that we may be able to do something with. That's a great idea. And what about um, just as kind of further that something on the website where someone can, you know, write in and, you know, instead of just in just email or sign up on a list or something like that on the website? Yes. So that's something that can be done on the home page where you can sign up for uh, alerts. If you go to www.northreadingma.gov, anything we post on the website or on social media, we are also sending out through a uh, what I'll call a reverse email system. It's oh, an email good. distribution list. Yeah. So it, I know that DBW staff has been signing folks up for the alerts, oh, that's great. Um, which is yeah. great, but uh, folks are able to do so. Um, I will note, we we have been relying a lot on the reverse 911. And I, you know, we, we from a public works and public safety standpoint, we're a bit concerned about over messaging in that yeah, avenue yeah. And, and the impact that that has. And, and after today's performance of coming and going to the wrong neighborhood effectively, um, it's probably the messages coming from us moving forward are going to be more focused about what the town is doing um, and, and providing recommendations rather than what Republic is doing because at the moment we just can't predict it. Okay. Anything else? Are we good to move on? Okay, great. <laughs> I guess I want to say one last time. Sorry. I don't want to keep... It's the most important thing. You know, this, our ability to control what's happening is extremely limited both because we're not in direct control of resources and because there are not a lot of options out there for us to make a quick change um, but we are sorry we're sorry this is happening especially for residents who are paying um, so much and for a department of public works that works so hard mm -hmm. to conduct itself in a professional uh, way um, this is not a reflection of the way the town runs the department of public works and it goes beyond sharing the frustration of our residents. Um, we don't want the town to have to go through this at all. And we understand the frustration that folks are, are, are feeling. Um, and, and, you know, again, Republic isn't saying it publicly at least, but we'll say it. You know, we are sorry it's happening. Thank you. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the next order of business, which is to sign the November 8th of 2022 state election warrant and we do have our city clerk here too yes welcome you hear that? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me back um, here for the next election, <laughs> um, which is um, I did a PowerPoint presentation um, similar to the last one that I did for the September 6th primary. Um, so election day is November 8th, 2022, this year, obviously. I have these postcards up here because Secretary Galvin mailed out, <clears throat> excuse me, he did a big mailing um, prior to the September 6th primary up until um, I believe it was the beginning of July, anybody who's registered to vote. So anybody who registered to vote between July 9th and the beginning of September uh, got this postcard in the mail, which is your mail-in, um, early ballot application. So there is a deadline for these, obviously. So the deadline, I don't know if you can see it, but the deadline for the November 8th election to apply 
for a mail-in ballot is November 1st by 5 o'clock. So these are the election deadlines, voter registration. So voter registration deadline is 10 days before every election. Um, with the new Votes Act, it used to be 20 days before, but now it's 10 days before. So for this election coming up, the deadline is October 29th is the deadline. So you have until midnight if you register online. The town clerk's office will be open because we're going to be there for in-person early voting anyways, 9 to 5. And I'll, um, you'll see the schedule in there. So again, the deadline for early mail-in ballot or absentee ballot is November 1st by 5 o'clock. That is a strict deadline. And I usually say I don't make this stuff up. You know, it's a law. And the next deadline is um, October 7th. So the day before the election by noontime, if you have an excuse. No, November, November 7th. November 7th. Oh, November 7th, I'm sorry. November 7th. Um, if you have an excuse, you can vote over the counter up until noontime the day before the election. Madam Town Clerk, Madam Chair, through you to the Town Clerk. Um, just on that absentee mail-in request, that's why 5 o'clock p.m. will the office be open until 5 o'clock p.m.? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have two weeks of in-person only voting. That is the law. So we're going to be open a lot of hours for two weeks, pretty much every day except for the two Sundays. So week one um, is uh, posted up here. These dates are also on the town website calendar and are on the town clerk's website page. Uh, we are gonna be open like Tuesday and Thursday nights, eight to eight for those who can't be come in uh, to vote early. It's in the gymnasium, which is the same place that we had in person only voting the last time in the primary. Week two, this is week two. So it starts um, October 22nd through November 4th. Now week two uh, comes in line with the deadline to register vote, change your party, which is October 29th. We will be there open nine to five regardless. And also I wanted to mention, if you have a mail-in ballot, you can bring your ballot in anytime, drop it in the drop box, anytime that we're in office open for early in-person voting. And then again, November 1st, um, we will be here for in-person early voting. So you can come in and apply for a, a mail-in ballot. That's a deadline. I don't know why anybody would apply for a mail-in ballot at that point, but because you can vote in person, which is what we would recommend. But So it ends November 4th, which is Friday before the election. So I had this up here the last time for my PowerPoint presentation. So the picture on the left is how it used to be for mail-in voting. So basically you just go to the polls, you know, you vote, and then you put your ballot in the machine and it's tabulated. Now on the right is the procedure now for mail-in voting. Obviously there's a lot more steps, you know, the town clerk's office is involved in so many procedures. But, um, you know, times have changed in voting. I think someday in the future, everything will be electronic <laughs> at some point. But so it's a, um, a long process and very time consuming. So this, uh, the ballot is actually very long and two sided. So I put a link on here, so it's going to take you right to the ballot. So on the town clerk's website page, there's a lot of information on here for the election. So over here is a sample ballot, okay? And it has this is the actual ballot that you'll be voting. And, uh, you know, it's the same office pretty much as the primary. And then we got four questions. You may have received in the mail, Secretary Galvin mailed a, a red voters book to everybody Hopefully you see it in the mail and it describes and explains the questions more in detail than what's on the actual ballot. So it's two-sided, right? So don't forget to, you know, turn your ballot over when you're voting, all right? It's two-sided. So when it explains, you know, what yes means and what no means, that's an actual law that says it has to be on the ballot. 
So on the town clerk's website, I also posted a lot of election information. So the first thing that's up there is a deadline to register to vote. So if you click on that link, okay, you can uh, register. This is when you have until midnight to register to vote. And you will be open that day until 5. So if you go back to the town clerk's website page over here, is the early voting in person in November, you know, if, I, if you forget the dates or times or whatever, you can always click here. Has all your information. It has all the dates and times. It has the register to vote. Um, Steph was nice enough to do a uh, QR code, which is awesome. Brings you right to the link. Okay, so there's all kinds of links here. You can, you know, I always suggest check now, don't wait until the last minute. The 29th is a deadline to do anything um, for this November 8th election. You can check everything here. You know, your party, your name and address. If you moved, you know, please change your address so it's correct on the voters list. Um, everything is here. And then if you scroll down to Oh, so there's a new, um, if you have a disability, this is something new. It's on Secretary Galvin's website. You have the capabilities as an application that the town clerk's office has. You have to apply, and then you are allowed to vote electronically. It's kind of like the similar process for the overseas voters and military. But there is a process. Um, there is a demo on the town clerk. Secretary Gallon's website if anybody has any questions or they can call the office. So your voter resources, the link is on here, elections, they have everything that you need for elections on here or online voter. You can track your ballot, you know, when you drop it off, we have to enter it in the computer when we receive it. So we enter it in the computer when we mail it out, we enter it in the computer when we receive it. Now for the primary, there were a lot of people that requested mail-in ballots that went to the polls and went to vote. They wanted to vote. So what happens then is, you know, we get a call from the warden, they we look them up, we have to reject their ballot in order for them to vote at the polls. We had a lot of that for the primary. So, and you see, you saw how many steps it takes for the office to process a ballot. So on this, this has everything on here. I always tell people, go on this website, it has applications, um, everything that you need to know. And then, okay, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint presentation, go back to that. <coughs> go back to my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Okay, this is a lovely ballot drop box, official ballot drop box. So also, please, if you're dropping a ballot off, it should be in a ballot envelope. We are getting ballots back that are not in a, a ballot envelope. Your ballot envelope should also be signed. If it's not signed, we have to reject it and send you another ballot. Also, if it's not in a ballot envelope, we have to reject it and send you another. So, um, this is open 24 7 it'll be locked um, at 8 p.m on election day you can drop applications in here your ballots um, anything election related sometimes we get other stuff in there too which is fine <laughs> we'll get it to where it has to go uh nothing different here uh one polling location for november 8 polling hours at 7 a.m to 8 p.m as usual st Teresa's um, on winter street and here's some election statistics for this election coming up. So um, obviously the registered voters will change. The deadline is October 29th. And so this is what we have registered as of today, registered voters. Early mail-in ballot requests. This is what we have so far, which is more than the primary. And we absentee mail-in requests 36. 
So out of the early mail-in ballots, we've received 150 so far, which isn't many yet, but it's early. And then seven absentee ballots received. So as I mentioned on Secretary Gallon's website, you have all of these that you saw. You can pre-register um, at age 16, and that automatically goes into another queue when you're gonna be of age and eligible to vote. So, um, deadline ready to vote. And that's the end. So um, this is just our emails. I'm gonna post this PowerPoint presentation on the Town Clerk website page. So, um, Anybody can view it. If they have questions, they can email us or call us. Okay, any thank questions? you. Do, does anyone have any questions? Just, just a quick question, Madam Chair. Just for, for those that were previously or are designated as inactive voters, registered inactive, he says you can check your status. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they have to do? So I always tell so you are made inactive if you have like no activity. So if you don't return your census, if um, you don't do anything for like four years. You know, you're actually going to get deleted after four years. You don't do anything. That's a lot. But um, what happens is I always tell everybody, return your census. Because when you go down to vote and you're inactive, it, it's a pain to get a ballot. You have to show ID. You have to sign a law. And then you get a ballot. So it takes a couple more steps. But yes, inactive means you're a voter. But you're inactive. You haven't followed all the procedures that need to be done every year to remain active. Now what happens is if you're inactive and you vote, it activates you. So technically somebody could not return their census and then vote, it activates them. So I don't know, it goes back and forth. But. And then one other question, just in relation to, are you asking for identification when people come in? Nope, we are not allowed to ask for them. Mass does not require an ID. So what happens is the poll workers, some people just like to show their ID. So the poll workers, I'll see, just look at them and say, thank you very nicely. You know, thank you for showing your ID. Um, the poll pads, uh, you've checked in, I'm sure. They have poll pads at the precincts. So there's a little, a little stanch in there that you put your ID on. That's simply just a quicker tool to look up the voter. But it's not required. It's not required by law. Nope, not in Massachusetts. Can we just clarify what instruction is given to the poll workers with regard to that issue? Um, well, basically, um, just accept your ID and say thank you. Some people, um, we did have some complaints of last primary. They didn't want to show ID. And the poll workers simply said, you know, it just makes it easier for a lookup tool to look up the voter. There is a, a manual way you can look it up, but the ID license is a barcode on the back which brings it right up on the poll pad. It just there was some misunderstanding I think at the primary so I heard a little bit of feedback about that that they were required to show their ID and I said I don't believe that was the case. No. Nope. But they they were asked for an ID. So yes to Mr. Gilberto's point, you know, how are poll work is instructed. So I, yeah, have, I have to fill out an affidavit a lot of the time when I go to vote because they tell me that I'm an inactive <laughs> voter and ask me who I am and I have to show ID a lot of the times when I vote. So Well, you should really participate a little bit more, Madam Chair, you know? <laughs> or send your census. Maybe run, run, run yeah. the select board more often. Yeah, yeah, that's all. <laughs> but that's all. That's why I asked. Yeah, well, I did have a couple of complaints yeah. about that. And, uh, you know, I did have to talk to the poll workers but, and just... And they do try to explain to the voter, you know, it's just a lookup tool. And I understand some people don't want to give their ID. And it's not required in Massachusetts. I don't know why, but, you know, we're like one of the few right. states that don't oh, yeah. require ID. So they try to deal with it nonchalantly, you know, finally, obviously. And don't make a big deal about it. Hopefully you have some some more training and stuff like that. Because yeah. unfortunately you have 12,000 registered voters, but it's really the same small group of us that does go out to vote. So mm -hmm. I know your poll workers are, don't all, aren't always the same, but hopefully they, they can, you know, run it very smoothly. And, you know, people are, people get offended at a lot of things easily, you know, no but. <laughs> 
you know, that's why you have the poll book and the, the name, the address, and, you know, most likely fam familiar faces that are coming through there again, because it's really the same people that vote in the elections over and over and over again. So, but once again, just thank you very much for the outreach and the effort that you're putting forth here. I think it's helpful. And yeah, hopefully, uh, great. Yeah. more great. people are motivated. Again, Absolutely. Making it easy now for people to vote is, uh, I think it's great. Thank you. You know, I'd great. like to tell, tell people that the poll pads are not certified by the state. So we can't solely use the poll pad. So it's basically just a, a, a great, it's an awesome lookup tool. You know, it just expedites the check-in process. So that's why when you go to check-in, there's a poll pad and then there's a paper punch. Yeah. So I can also do away with the checkout table, but I'm not ready to do that yet. Yeah, but some people leave their wallet in their car and they don't they don't bring that. They're just going in to do a come in quickly, they know <laughs> what they're voting and who they're voting, so they don't always bring their right idea or a, a gas bill or something, you know, gas or electric bill to prove their residency. So but it's great. This is really fantastic that people can go right to this website in that you've added all those links in for, for especially to generate some new new registrations, hopefully, for the town. So Thank we need you. people to get out and vote. Yeah. Any, yes, any yeah. other, anything really Thank Very Thank good, you. thanks Thank a lot. Much. And Thank we you. have a vote too, we have to. We yep. have a vote for you. Madam Chair, I move to sign the November 8th, 2022 state election warrant. Second. Motion by Mr. <laughs> Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you much. Today. Thank you. Are we, you, we're going to sign that now? We're going to sign, yeah, Doug's going to win this signature okay. right now. Okay, that's great. And I'm going to be copied. You're watching us. All right. Yes, I didn't even sign up. It's not at the same place, though. Oh, it is? I thought they sold that. Okay. That's good. All right. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't look too bad. Hmm. Oh. Hmm? I'll sign it, but they probably will ask me for my ID. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to want to make copy real quick. I don't know. I'm, I'm questioning that. I know. Thank you. All right. Oh, yeah. That was that. Mr. Gilbert, are we good? I believe so. Good. Let's move on to the next order of business, which is public comment. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak in public comment? Anybody joining? Anybody join? Anybody remotely, Mr. Gilberto? So we, we were having an issue with the chat, but I think we've corrected it. And uh, I will just note that Maureen already commented under the previous agenda item that the red book issued by the state secretary did not include any details in question four. The booklet printing deadline was prior to the deadline for signatures to be turned in by the sponsors of that question and certified by the secretary of state. Wow, that, that's a great piece of information. So, thank you. But that seems to be the only comment that I do not see any hands raised. Okay, great. Let's move on to the <coughs> next order of business, which is the wastewater project update and discussion. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, so, by way of the, the brief update, in advance of maybe the longer discussion, <laughs> We have been, and I say we, myself, um, the Director of Public Works, Mr. Parisi, who's here this evening, um, our consultants from Wright Pierce, who are also here this evening, and our consultants from Kleinfelder um, and FXM, uh, Kleinfelder being uh, attending uh, via uh, virtual participation, have been engaged in a number of presentations relative to the wastewater program, uh, beginning with this board in the middle of September, and then with a more public presentation at the end of September, followed by a presentation to the Community Planning Commission, the Economic Development Committee, the Finance Committee, and this evening, the School Committee. Uh, we also had the first of a community information sessions last Tuesday night, 
at the distance learning lab at the um, middle high school it was attended by uh, 19 people uh, who were there and there were some great questions and great dialogue. Uh, we have another information session scheduled uh, for tomorrow evening and we've seen a lot of um, discussion um, electronically and also gotten some inquiries in the DPW office. Um, it's targeted more towards the residents who live along the route. So that's um, single family homeowners along the stretch of Park Street and North Street, um, the condominiums at Pulte Homes in New England, uh, and multiple uh, condominium units and some single family homes along Main Street as well, uh, as well as a short area of Concord Street. Um, and so we look forward to what we expect will be some, um, some good attendance at a meeting tomorrow evening and be able to uh, engage in more discussion. Um, as much as we'd love to go through the entirety of the presentation again this evening, we weren't planning to. Uh, we were instead looking to maybe just bring to light some of the so-called decision points that we've been talking about a little bit and um, maybe put them on the board members, um, you know, the front of the board members' mind as something to consider as we go through the next few weeks and continue to get feedback from the community. So, um, Mr. Gavota, may I just quickly ask you, you're meeting this evening, you and in, in a uh, Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Studo met also with the school committee this evening. That's correct. Was, did the school committee convene early to meet with you they all did. early? They did. convened at five thirty. Yes. So and so that's another was and that was another public uh, forum. Yes. Right to for for which you begin with trying to roll this out as best as possible. That's correct. In as many public forums as possible. So did they have any questions of you? Yeah, or is some, it just a really kind good, of a food for thought type of a... some some good questions and um, some we heard some some feedback from the individual members uh, along the way. Um, I, I I think I I moved quickly to the, the purpose, but I, I neglected to mention that Mr. Studo, and Mr. O'Leary have been at all of these presentations yes. as well, right. and that is in addition to the hundreds of hours that they have provided over the past year for planning right. for this project. Right. Um, so discussion points. I just I think that it's a great thing to be concise, but I also want to, with clarity to express that this is multiple years in the works. It's not just something we've, we've decided to do this mm -hmm. past month. It, this has been multiple years in consideration, study, planning phases. And now we're at this phase of trying to get this in, in, moved forward with the residents. So those discussion points are, be, are relating to the presentations that you've been you've been making. So if you if you would please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I wanted to um, touch base on the decision points to be made. Um, so the select board as uh, sewer commissioners basically do have some decisions to be made. So just want to make sure that we have a little bit of discussion on that before the time comes to make those decisions. So. Um, just, again, briefly looking at the project area that I think we're all familiar with where that is. Um, so I'll move on from there. And just as an aside, I mean, betterments are, you know, what we are going to be uh, looking at in, in some detail in the decision points that you make to sort of get to um, a number. Um, so general benefits facilities are involved in any sewer project as well as special benefits facilities. So we will uh, look to um, make some decisions uh, at a vote at town meeting to determine, you know, the borrowing of, of the project funds and also um, better assessments to be made, perhaps methods of assessments, and uh, ultimately come up with a means to uh, come to a number uh, for better assessments based on cost sharing. <coughs> And so a betterment works as a lien, a municipal lien on property. So that will um, be true for, for properties that abut the sewer and uh, are assessed betterments. So uniform, uh, unit uniform method, uh, just making sure that everybody is treated the same way in some uniform way to uh, share the cost of the project. So betterment and debt planning uh, variables. So there's some, certainly some town um, decision points to be made. Uh, we've done a little base model here that has some assumptions, but you know this is just a base model. You know decisions you make will certainly change. Um, you know the numbers around a bit. 
but there's pros, uh, project cost allocations, there's betterment uh, methodology, loan period and interest rates. Residential opt-out is, is certainly an option to discuss and consider. Um, you know, there's allowable residential commercial growth. Uh, you may uh, want to you know, target certain growth um, and, and maybe not others. And uh, <clears throat> tax rate adjustments, other revenue sources, this all plays a part in determining uh, betterment assessments in, in, in the debt planning. Uh, so at, uh, I guess it was the June 21 town meeting, we had a, a betterment bylaw that was uh, uh, modified from its uh, new bylaw we had on the books. And so this is what we uh, had approved at town meeting. So uh, again, it's looking at, you know, the select board as uh, sewer commissioners being able to assess up to 100% of the project cost and um, you know laying out making decisions about you know, the project layouts and, and <clears throat> you know moving uh, on to a betterment assessment utilizing the so-called uniform uh, unit method we talked about recently and also you know having um, you know, the ability to separate the general benefits from the uh, special benefits of the project. So betterment determination process. So we, we have some decision points as I talked about. So I'll talk about, <clears throat> you know, the, um, we'll start here at number one. So other revenue sources, what we're talking about here, uh, you know, what are the revenue sources that could reduce the ultimate cost of the project that will be bettered? Um, so we, for instance, have uh, an appropriation already uh, for the project design, preliminary design and some permitting of uh, $2,893,000. So that's a, an example of number one. There could be grants that also are approved or, or are uh, awarded to the town, maybe some other additional special revenues that the town appropriates. <laughs> but if they're appropriated before um, you know, a vote of town meeting to uh, assess betterments, those do not qualify for project costs that will be assessed to betterment. So you can see in some of the slides we'll show sooner, I mean, the, the project uh, total cost is, you know, one million, you know, 131 million, but we reduce that down by what we've already appropriated. So we're at one million, and I'll just switch to that now. We're at 129 million, 100,000. So it's the 2.893 million coming off of the 131 million, 993. And so that's where we're, we're coming up with uh, 129, 100,000 to be assessed. Joe, sorry, Madam Chair, through you. So just to reiterate, that money cannot be recovered through better, for those who don't know. That, that, that that's correct. So number one, it is not, um, money that could be uh, recovered through that, that's correct. All right, so we'll come back to this. I'll go back to the decision points quick. So number two, so that's that becomes the eligible cost of the, of the project or the wastewater project. Um, and then we will look at eligible costs to be assessed into uh, two categories, the general benefits facility and the special benefits facility. So that's where it's more of an engineering estimate of uh, project uh, costs in, in a couple of in those two categories. Um, ultimately, when the project goes out to bid, I can envision having um, you know bid forms that really sort of separate the types of work into those two categories as well. Um, but you know there are there are general benefits that are typically the the pump stations and force mains uh, of the project and. Uh, special benefits that will be more specific to, you know, the collections of, um, you know, the local collections of the wastewater to each of the properties connecting. So once you have those two categories of, of costs, we're going to, again, look to um, do a little uh, cost here, if you will, into betterments and sewer privilege fees. So general benefits, there are certain percentages of um, the overall design flow that will be actually used in the project area and the other uh, flow that would be reserved for later purposes, later expansions or uh, new growth. 
in the in the project area. So we would look to uh, sort of use a, a ratio, if you will, of, of current water use or Title V water use to the overall permitted uh, amount of sewer flow. And sort of like in the model that we have now, it's like 40% of the uh, properties that abut you know, the phase one sewer are <clears throat> being um, assigned or utilized upon that connection. The other 60%, the general fund really is reserving for future um, you know, expansion into phase two or growth of uh, properties that are connected you know, to, to sort of have a, maybe a denser use of the property, um, some expansion of the property that requires and will um, generate more uh, water use in uh, uh, wastewater uh, disposal. So splitting that out, <clears throat> uh, just going a little bit further, the, the privilege fees would be assessed as a fee um, in a similar manner that, you know, in cost per gallon, if you will, um, to those that utilize, you know, that capacity we're reserving. But ultimately, you know, the general fund has to pay for that until such time, you know, those fees are uh, assessed, collected, and available to pay debt service. Um, flipping back over to the special benefits facilities, <laughs> we're having a percentage of that assigned to benefits, and I don't see many reasons why you wouldn't assign, you know, 100% of that special benefits. Those are costs that wouldn't necessarily be incurred um, or utilize, you know, another other uh, project areas. So um, in this model, 100% of that special benefits cost is being brought down into uh, the benefits. And when you combine, you know, the percentage from the general benefits and the, and the percentage of the special benefits, you've got a total of uh, benefit assessments shown there at the bottom. So those are some of the more basic decision points. We'll, we'll get to another one in a bit. So just going through this again. So project cost allocations, benefit uh, methodology, loan period, and interest rate. So we're looking at trying to uh, sort of pay this loan over a 30 year period. It helps to uh, spread those, uh, the cost of the project over a longer period. The betterments will be, uh, can be a portion on the tax bill. So the long, longer number of years you have to pay that, the smaller the, the um, you know, like yearly cost will be. So this is just uh, looking back at, <clears throat> You know, those uh, decision points. So the cost used to determine better assessments is based on a portion of the total eligible cost. Select board will vote to determine the division of those costs and the final betterments are determined upon project completion once project costs are finalized. So the costs that we see in these uh, slides are just based on estimates that the engineers have come up with, but Mass General Law will require, you know, the final project to be completed, final cost to be known, and then uh, the methods that you choose to uh, create a betterment assessment or determine the betterment assessment will be applied to those final costs. So here are some numbers in the model that we have. So you, you can see how they, um, they flow down the uh, decision tree based on certain percentages that are shown there as well. Madam Chair, through you. Yes, you go further. To the DPW director, can you just go back a slide there? Um, so just looking at the breakdown that's here, the way we are apportioning the costs here, almost 78%, uh, so almost 80% of the costs are associated with getting wastewater into the pump stations and sent to the plant in, in North Andover, right? I mean, it's a significant chunk of the cost. Correct. 22% of the cost there is effectively the gravity mains in the neighborhoods connecting to that system. So the pipes in the individual streets that are connected to that larger system. So there's a significant amount of the cost tied up in connecting with the plant, which is no surprise because we're going you know, through the communities to get there. Or if we go one route, we're going to actually you know, into one community, back out and then back into another. The way this model has been put together, 
while we're talking about a general fund subsidy, it's on the general benefits side of this equation, right? We have not proposed any general fund resources to offset the special benefit facilities. So when we're talking about that cost, it's to, to build a system that will convey the wastewater to the plant. And there's a portion of that flow that has been reserved for future development that hasn't happened yet. And until it happens, it's the taxpayer that we're asking to cover that cost um, to allow the project to move forward. I think that we kind of are making an assumption that that, that that alone, the general fund portion for the general benefits facilities is a significant. I, I think that we're kind of looking for feedback that we're not off base that providing a subsidy for the special benefits, a smaller amount is probably not a direction we'd be looking to go because it would be additional taxpayer expense. And so that's something we need to think about, obviously, as we're looking at you know the basics of the model. I, I, we took it as a, because that general benefit number is so large, we took it that, that that's where we sort of drew the line at the projection. Um, we also have to defend whatever the betterment is. So when we start talking about the special benefit facility, I think that we were comfortable that we could defend assessing 100% of the special benefit cost to the direct abutters of the property since they would be directly benefiting to it. So it's not something we have to answer this evening, but it's one of the things that we really need to sort of consider as we go forward. Um, and Madam Chair, through you, I just, I know you're kind of going in order off that, but I do think soon we need to talk about the residential opt up because that is such a big <clears throat> impact when we start talking about the other numbers. Well, I think this is a good time to do that then. Okay. <laughs> that was not coordinated. <clears throat> so, can I just, I want a quick question. I know this really isn't the time for question and answer, but you mentioned this. If, can you go back that just one slide back to what Mr. Gilberto? No, that one. But so if we were to, I know what you're saying in terms of how it filters down in this uh, diagram, but let's say when we have other revenue sources, let's say we get grant funding and you're putting that in right at the outset so that it trickles down in this calculation. So we're not collecting anything else back either if we put it in right, at the, let's say we have to put the Pulte homes funding towards this and or grant funding that we might get federal funding or state funding for it. you're putting it right in the, at the beginning as other revenue sources for for purposes of for grant funding i would say yes that that's the model we've discussed there was a point in time when i was trying to understand if there was another way to to, to do it but I, I think the way the the law is written in the assessment we would need to apply that at the very top and then it yes. kind of filters its way down. Yeah. I, I think, and I'm gonna express a, a personal opinion, but it, it's probably in line with what you'll hear as a recommendation from me along the way. There was a point in time where I, I wondered whether using so the so-called Pulte money to reduce the principal would be the best way to move forward. The cost of the project is so significant and the potential issues with revenue in the early years are so significant that I think we're gonna probably have to rely on that funding to make debt service payments in the first oh, few honestly, years, okay. rather than actually defraying the principal down, um, because we're not gonna have that revenue stream coming in. And we've talked, Finance Committee in particular has brought that up as a concern. And you know whether or not it's sufficient funding to even cover multiple years is something we, we still need to work through. Mm -hmm. But I do think, and I, I'm kind of looking at the Finance Director, the Treasurer, and the two members of the Finance Committee, I think we all kind of are coming to the same point that we're going to have a significant debt service issue at the beginning of this project, and we 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 have an we may have an opportunity whether we want to use the Pulte funding for that or not. We have a significant debt service issue that I think we need to be thinking about as we're going through this process. And that's an acceptable use of those funds to pay down the debt service. Uh, it would be for debt service payment. I'll just defer to the finance director who's here, but I believe we've got through that. Oh no, you're not. Oh, you're Madam Chair. That's correct. Any um, debt service or capital that costs or has a life greater than um, five years or more, we can use those oh, funds. Okay. So that's a detail we found on land is um, allows us to use. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. So you're not factoring that in at all because you need that. We need that as a buffer if this were to 
to, we, to be able to pay down. We, we've done tremendous work in projecting the expenses in terms of the betterment expense and the expense of the taxpayer, but they're not flat. It, it isn't like it's going to be this number every year coming in. Mm -hmm. We could see a, a spike as soon as the pipe goes in the ground. It could be you know, quiet for a while, and then we could see another spike in development. Yeah. Um, it's just something that we really have to be cognizant of in terms of the debt service for the general fund, you know, the taxpayer, and also, and Ms. Hurlba and I have had multiple conversations on this, the timing of betterment revenue as well is something that we need to be thinking about and how, how soon that is coming in and available to, to make the payments. And the, not that these are, these are, it's not that these are problems that cannot be solved, it's just that these are issues that as we refine this process, we're going to need to, you know, be having more conversation about in the coming weeks. Thanks, Joy. I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought there, but all right, no problem. So, um, all right, so we will move down. I'll stop by seeing anything that um, needs to be discussed or mentioned. So, similar, um, just cost splitting here. Uh, yeah, so there are some uh, exempt properties that are <coughs> going to be assessed, but not collected. So the uh, Mass General Law requires that all properties that are <coughs> able to benefit or connect to the sewer will share the cost, or at least the calculations of the betterments will be based with those uh, properties in, in the equation. But when it actually comes to assessing those properties that uh, fall under exempt, um, they're not collectible. So the town hall, um, you know, the, the federal uh, postal service property on Main Street, and also uh, a, a state-owned property on the uh, corner of uh, intersection of Lowell and North Street, um, will be part of the formula for assessing betterments, but they will not be collected. And Madam Chair, through you, just because I think it's an important point, there are two uh, religious properties, I believe, along the route. Can, can we just clarify how Yeah, so are? so exempt in this particular case is not like tax exempt. It's very specific exemption of, of betterments. So those uh, couple of properties that are uh, religious properties um, will be assessed betterments. That's master of law, um, laws that they be, uh, requires that they be part of the betterment calculations and, and it's uh, betterment assessment that would take place on those properties as well. All right, so um, just moving on. And so you could you know, basically have different you know, impacts to the general fund based on you know, certain decisions that are made in the process. And I think we talked about actual water use as a method, a uniform method in Title V current you know, use or, or, or current build Title V. Uh, Title V would be higher in most all occasions, I believe, than the actual water use. It's a safety factor built in there, I'm sure. But um, those are two methods that, of uniform assessments that we you know, looked at in determining uh, equivalent sewer units. So the equivalency uh, of a sewer unit is based on a single family home. So that's the basis of you know, how you would assess uh, properties that are not single family homes, in other words. You know, the single family home for actual water use is 130 gallons uh, per day. So if you're looking at some commercial properties and they have uh, multiple uh, water use above and beyond a single family home, you just take their water use divided by 130 gallons per day and you'll get the number of sewer units. Each sewer unit in our uh, model, I believe, was approximately uh, $47,000 for a single family home. So um, that's... Yeah, that's what we're looking at when we actually determine better assessments for all the properties connecting. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. That's pretty much what we talked about. Well, while you're going through, Madam Chair, through you, I mean, I think that, and I think I speak for Mr. O'Leary and Mrs. Studo, and they can certainly speak up if they, they disagree. But you know, what we, I think what we really liked about the water use method was it was a real indicator of what a property was using and was likely to be using for wastewater. We got some great questions from um, from both Mr. Studo and Mr. O'Leary and from the Planning Commission with regard to how does irrigation fit into this. And we did some analysis and it's not a significant uh, skewing of the numbers based on irrigation. It's pretty reliable numbers over the past few years in terms of what a, a share would be. Um, 
you're not able, we're not able to assess within single family homes, you know, one house is using this much water, another house is using that much water. The law isn't written that way. Um, you, you establish a unit and the single family unit re re represents that. And, but the way we got to that was using um, the, the water calculation. The, the full build out number, and again, I, I, I don't know how much the board wants or not wants to hear this information, but I'm trying to give the whole picture. The full build out issue that we looked at, the full build out model of Title V, that, that was you know multiple factors of the available gallons that we can get from the plant. I mean, it just, it was skewing the numbers so badly um, that not that it couldn't be defended under the law because we could have made the legal argument and defended it, but from a practical standpoint of saying to people, look, this is really built off the water usage. We felt that that I think was fairest, but that's a decision that the board can obviously um, adjust if it feels it wants to go in a different direction. And I, I think I'm accurate in saying we've not heard feedback detrimental to that strategy in the, the multiple meetings we've had so far. Um, but we obviously have a pretty significant meeting tomorrow night with the residential letters. And again, from a practical standpoint, dollars and cents, the other two methodologies generally come out higher. So yeah. from a practical standpoint, they're going to say, yes, I like that choice better. Yeah, yeah so How did you yeah, stop answer this the slide question right on irrigation, though? Well, in other words, that, that we have smart meters, right? So can, couldn't that be reduced to... Uh, Actual. I, I think I think we found we didn't need to, but I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Oh, Parisi okay. or the, to Mr. That's Mr. a great question, though. Yeah, no, it's yeah not we can screw the numbers. The yes, it's not going into them. How did you respond to that? Clark, uh, Welcome, Mr. Clark. He's attended a lot of meetings, but oh, had a chance word, to talk. <laughs> He's been waiting for this episode. It's not much fair to him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm told I'm mostly here as a calming presence. So <laughs> <laughs> that get to speak are, as, as, as has been his history. It's a thrill. Yes, uh, yeah. So <laughs> the the primary, primary, the primary you song about that? <laughs> no, it's a that. thrill to speak. Um, the primary answer is the largest irrigation users in this this area mostly have separate irrigation meters to them. So if we look at like Edgewood, uh, they have separate strictly irrigation meters. So we're able to just separate that out. Um, the Subaru dealer up here uses a lot of irrigation water, but they have a separate meter for that. We also are, because we have smart meters, we're able to look to daily use. We're also able to look certainly to quarterly use and we can look at winter water use versus summer water use when we looked at the whole study area and did a you know winter quarters versus summer quarters the ratio was 1.01 to 1 so there wasn't a huge spike in the data from winter to summer so the irrigation mm -hmm. isn't factoring in as a huge factor it's nominal. No. And, you know if somebody's going to challenge it we can certainly with our smart meter data, we have three years worth of daily, even hourly water reading. So we can certainly, you know, disaggregate it more if the, the need comes up. Thank you. I'll just say, I'll say this every time, smart meters was the best decision we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Mark. So um, I did stop at this uh, slide. It, it does show, you know, the uh, actual water use and the Title V current bill. The third method that we looked at, you know, the, the highest and best use of the property, like uh, Mr. Gilberto said, it, it sort of um, calculated water use that's far above what we're able to permit our, our permit here. So um, we did not uh, put that on the on the chart of the slide here. Um, but I, I do want to point out that, you know, there is uh, that excess capacity, as I talked about. And um, so when you assess uh, betterments, I mean, you are able to assess additional betterments only um, to those properties that are currently assessed. So currently by mass general law, that reserve capacity is used for properties that are already bettered. But what will happen is, you know, we ass we're assessing for the current use and we know that we hope that there'll be expansion of existing properties, um, more square footage of you know, building space or different tenants that use more water. Um, all of those could you know, sort of make uh, water use and sewer sort of disposal, wastewater disposal, higher than what we assessed or originally um, based the betterment on. And so uh, a lot of communities do assess additional privilege fees on that growth, if you will, on, on the um, additional water use 
uh, slash uh, the wastewater use that they would um, have after the fact, after sewers are installed. And so there's a little special legislation that goes along with that to allow you to, to do that. And we're talking already with uh, KP Law to incorporate that in a, in a decision point to be made with the select board. Okay. You were going to discuss the opt out. Before. Yeah, so that's uh, that should be coming up um, now. Going a few slides. If you Residential opt out. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Yep. I was just going to say when you address this, if the if the parcel opts out, if they then in the future decide to opt in and join, would their the betterment be assessed at that time? So yeah, so that would be a um, like a privilege fee, fee being assessed later on. Okay. All right. So so again, through special legislation, you know there is uh, an opportunity to allow a residential opt out. Uh, and again, as we talked before about having to calculate betterments with those exempt, um, you know, state, federal, municipal um, properties, you do so with all the residential properties as well. In other words, the betterments uh, are calculated with everybody that abut the property, uh, I mean, abut the sewer project. Um, otherwise, if you just said, well, residential opt out, that means, you know, the, the remaining have to, you um, pay that their cost. No, it doesn't happen that way. The benefits are assessed in um, in its entirety with everybody abutting the property. So if there's an opt out, what that means is that's just reserve capacity that the general fund is keeping. And as we talked about before, the general fund is paying that debt service because it can't be and will not be part of the benefit assessments to those that are tying in. In other words, betterments don't go up because residential opt-out happens. It, it stays consistent. All right, so there are some, some uh, impacts, though. As we talked about, it's the general fund that's picking up the extra cost, if you will, the, the revenues that are coming in through residential um, betterment assessments. Um, that means the general fund debt service obligation is going to be greater. So we'll see that $660 for the average single family house go up to, I think it's a uh, thousand and eighty, there you go. If a hundred percent opt out happened. Now, residential opt out, you know, for this particular project, um, the sewer passes a lot of uh, like density residential properties, condominium uh, properties, large, um, apartment complexes. So I think you would see a higher percentage. You know, I don't know if it'll be exactly, it won't be a hundred. I think there's some interest to have, you know, some properties, residential properties connect, but it'll be certainly quite low, I think. So what, you know, would happen is there would be some impacts, you know, to um, taxpayers, uh, those that are you know, not connecting, it would be purely the general fund's obligation that would um, uh, be paid uh, above and beyond what the normal taxes are now. You can see certain percentages of the opt-out. Just to be clear, this says non-sewered residents, but it's actually all residents. That's correct, yeah, I'm even, sorry, even those in, the, yes. in the district that, are, that would normally be better, get this. This is this is all parcels of land in North Reading, an average of whatever the, that assessment evaluation is, this is the impact on all parcels. And then <clears throat> on top of this, for those that are in the district, would get bettered. So this slide would show those sewage residents that are also, you know, paying betterments in, in, in um, the opt-out increases. So, so again, as they opt out, their share of the general fund, like everybody else's, increases. And then just to clarify, Joe, so the, the privilege fees, are they equal or the same as a betterment fee? Typically, they would be similar to what was assessed at the original time of the betterment assessments. Um, you could, if, if uh, you know, people that are coming in later, you could have, you know, some means to, um, you know, cost of living type increases um, apply to those assessments so that, you know, you're, you're getting basically the same dollar uh, valuation, if you will, in some future years. 
for the board members, if you recall, we were negotiating with the MWRA and even with the Great Lawrence Sewer District. There's a buy-in. In other words, so we're a new customer, so we're basically, and we're going to be better, so we're going to pay our fair share to what's already been invested in by the rest of the district, right? And we're going to pay that betterment up front. We're going to pay that in addition to whatever our fees are going to be going forward. Same idea. So just, just a quick question though. What we're going to be asked to either decide to have an opt in, opt out policy or not. It's not a tier. It's not, you're not asking us to make a choice between the four. It's either we're going to allow people to be opt out or. That, that's that's correct. Just one or the other. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. And also for how long? But you can also do that, correct? You can oh, say, you, can, you can do a number of things, but I, I would think that, um, you know, this is, there are communities that have done opt out and you can't opt back in. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, concern and reserve capacity was, was so limited that, you know, you want to have a commitment so you know what you can do going forward in other areas of town, right? So we have a, a certain amount of reserve capacity that I believe on the slides is um, about 233,000 gallons, um, which, you know, should be sufficient for um, growth. And we've already reserved for phase two in the Mountains Pond area. So if there is uh, an opt out, that 233 would go even higher. Just one, one more quick question on this total annual cost that is going to be every tax there is that based on all, no other i guess revenue sources you're using the figure that you first started out with and that's correct too right we this is i don't you know we try to um just sort of given the estimates that we have from the engineers now just use those as, as a um, number that we would put in the into a, a model formula here so that's without any other kind of funding or anything. It's kind of, if we get nothing else to Correct. cover the cost of this. Worst, it's sort of a worst case scenario. That, that right. if we do not have an opt out policy that every, basically every, um, every parcel will have that additional 3,660 per year in taxes, right? I mean, that's what this is saying, right? Those are it, sewer residents. I could go back. Well, that, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, it's six hundred and sixty dollars for those that aren't in the district. It's six hundred and sixty dollars if we don't have an if we don't have an opt out, so fifty five dollars a month, or a thousand and eighty if we get a hundred percent opt out of residential. A thousand eighty for everybody across the board. No, I I think my I think I misunderstood when you said we all will be sharing we'll all be sharing the cost of that but um everybody gets hit with either somewhere between 660 and a thousand okay i missed that i'm yeah. sorry yeah. everybody gets hit with that and then if you're in the district if you're going to be sewered you then get the betterment on top of that so this when you go to this this right here that total annual cost not only includes what everyone is paying, but also the betterment that's assessed right. per, okay, that's. So here's the average monthly tax increase this column here, and here's the average monthly betterment. But what method did you use to calculate that? The water usage method? Yes. yes. Which is the cheap, I don't want to well, say cheapest because it's, it's not cheap. It's the most fair. The most fair or the. The least costly, it seems. No, it's like the most fair method. methodology okay. that we can use for a common denominator. So how is it going, how is it that, that isn't that going to be different per parcel then? It is. It's a parcel by parcel you know, calculation. So is this a minimum amount that you have here? So uh, this is the average yeah. single family? Average. Okay. Average. Which is a house. Average assessed assess valuation. Six four. four. And then... Average based upon per single family unit. Okay. Okay. So again, if you have a restaurant which has, which has been determined to have a hundred units or 50, 50 single family unit equivalent, you know, it's 50 times this. You know, so it fluctuates based upon the current use of the property and the current water use on the property, <coughs> all gauged and measured by that common denominator of 330 gallons per day. Okay. 
Do you have, Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have a question? I have a different question about opt out, so I don't want to. Once you clear this up, I'll yeah, just that. Mr. Studo wanted to maybe add something into well, that. About annual cost again, and I sound like a broken record, but just like we're not including any revenues to come up to these costs, also, uh, we're using a 5% interest rate um, based on our bond rating as of an hour ago. Our 30 year would be roughly four and a quarter. So just to show you how significant that is of us using a higher rate of five versus what we could get theoretically if we financed out the, if tomorrow we just took out a $129 million bond, you're looking at roughly the difference of about, let's see here, $700,000 a year of interest. That's a four and a quarter. If we could ever refi down the four, that's a million dollar difference in interest. So again, I just want to say that because though that's a big difference. Just like we're not, I mean, we've pretty much given the worst of the worst. It's and conservative. That, it's a conservative. Very conservative. conservative. And we've also then assumed out numbers that over 30 year practically, I mean, I couldn't get an economist to agree with if he was watching this presentation. So um, just wanted to point that out okay, again. That's good. Thanks. Mrs. Gonzalez. We're all covered that. I just want to clarify opt out. So somebody decides to opt out and then their septic fails. They can no longer put in a new septic, correct? Would be, would that, that yeah, be? that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think that would definitely be the case. I mean, any requirement to connect into the sewer would, would uh, certainly I think a failed septic system would be a good reason to require that. So, so along the route, nobody would be allowed to put in a new septic anymore once the sewer goes through. I, I can imagine that um, you know to to do an opt out that you would have to have some verification by the board of health that the septic system is not a failure. Oh, I thought you were asking differently that if they did opt out though, after if, if they after they opt out and their system failed, right. why wouldn't they be able to put in another septic system? Because public sewer is available and that's pretty Correct. common that for the requirement of the Board of Health to yeah. the opt out happen. feature, the way that it's being discussed here right now, is that people would be allowed to postpone the inevitable. Right. Eventually, you're going to be tied in. It's just a question of when. Oh, I see. Okay. And who? <laughs> if you don't no, know. just a question no, of I when. Know, and again, what the use is going to be too. And again, as some people, if, if the board were to decide to provide this residential opt-out, and someone opted out, and they sold their property, there was no betterment to be repaid or anything, they sold their property, and there's going to be a different use for that property now to tie it in. Mm -hmm. yeah. But on the other hand, if somebody just put in a new septic, they don't want to put time into the sewer now. They just put uh, other than there. the fact that you may want to consider it only because the cost of doing it may be more expensive later on. Because as Mr. Parisi pointed out, mm -hmm. there are general provisions sometimes that allow for not just a one for one, you know, if it's you know, $45,000 as a betterment to tie in and it's not 45000 10 years from now because there are escalation costs associated with maintaining the system and all the rest of the system. So when it's that plus <coughs> some other factor, so it may cost them more, but something that will cost them less today. But maybe 10 years from now, there will be availability. Oh, there'll be avail there will be availability as far as capacity. Mm -hmm. What we're building here will have sufficient capacity for the foreseeable future. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we're not we're not Because right now, what would you, the, the, the numbers that you've seen and the ratios that you've seen, are based upon current water usage, right? And that's still less than 50% of the capacity of the system itself that we're building. You know, and then it less than 50% of the capacity of what we're, going to, what we're permitted for, the 503. The capacity of the system is going to be built to take some 700,000 gallons per day, not 503. So that if we need to grow into the system, the system has the capacity to take more, all we have to do is change the permit. So, it's not, it, again, my guess is within the 30 years, and, you know, um, there'll be still capacity for people who have opted out but reserve their right to tie in. Right. They, won't be, they won't lose their ability to do so. And but we they do. probably will be compelled, if this is how we wish to decide, 
compelled to tie in if their system fails and if there's a change in use. I would I would see opt out to I know we we know we don't have to decide this evening, but it I would see opt out as a and, and it it's it may be hard for people that have this mindset, but three hundred and five dollars a month is is maybe a significant financial constraint for some of the homeowners along the road, and that. Although it may not looking to us seem like it's a big sum for some people, it's a, an insurmountable amount depending on what yeah. their financial circumstances. But, but I would be open to, yeah, you well, not open because we haven't had the discussion. But it's like you want to make it fair, especially for that example. Yes. Yeah. But at the same time, um, you know, I mean, we're gonna have more discussion. But failing, I I think I you know, again. Like, I think the board should strongly consider that if, if somebody had a failing system in 10, 20 years, five, one, luck of the draw, that you're going to sewer, which seems to be a pretty standard provision statewide. Why not? And, you know, I, I, I highly doubt I, we would get any pushback from the Board of Health on that one. And then, uh, you know, again, for, I mean, property. So if we allowed it, if if you also believe that there could be a lot of change of hands of the properties because again i think that we actually have recorded emails for developers who if we had sewer would have pumped millions into this town and that's a fact and if anybody wants it i can one-on-one -on -one with them of who it was but i think that it should be required i, I didn't even think of that mr o'leary i mean or that's something i would look at that yeah. if you're going to do something different than what it already is like there's that you go into it knowing that, right? That if I'm gonna buy your house and put up whatever, that, you know, like irrespective of that sewer is one year old or 30 of the sept, excuse me, you're gonna have to go in. So well, that's just how I'm looking at it. Well, I, again, I'm not saying that a single family home that has a new septic system and opts out right now, and a new buyer comes in and is gonna use a single family home and not change the use, then the system hasn't failed, not necessarily. But if they're gonna buy that unit, buy that, home and change its use yeah. and, incre and increase the, the purchase of water and then effluent. Yeah, the tie in there. But so are you factoring in, let's say, like for example, the storage facility that doesn't use a lot of water then becomes a, you know, huge, you know. Becomes an apartment building. A part retail and or, yeah, are they going to pay more Obviously, for that? Or? Yeah. Right, that's but, where but again, uh, they're not a another sewer produce. But, but, but again, that, that, that's, that storage hey, oh, facility. Okay. But that storage facility is not residential right now, so they wouldn't be allowed to opt out under this proposal. Yes, no, right? I just so they wouldn't be allowed. Idea. But they would. However, yeah, if, I that am, guy, but, if we storage yeah. buys the door, they say, "Okay, I've got this big storage facility now. Yeah. Wow, I can. The value of this property just went up exponentially, course, and the value yeah. of what I could use this property for is far more valuable. X, Y, Z. Yeah. Then they're their usage is going to be increased, their buy-in value is going to be increased, the betterment is going to be increased based upon what their proposed use is going to be, not what is current use. Everything's yeah. being treated right now, current use. And as those uses change, their ability to buy in and change that use and produce more storage is going to increase their betterment costs. They're going to pay a privilege fee for the change in use. Yeah. Okay. Which is going to eat into the growth factor that we but I think what I, I, my thought was, of course, we, I feel like you should allow someone who's just put in a new septic to not have to go into the sewer. But when and if that septic fails, there shouldn't be an option to put another septic in. Well, they should again, have to tie in correct. The, the, the community has now made an investment in a public yeah. sewer system going right by your doorway. You can use what you have right now as so long until it fails. And that's what I'm saying. Well, people will then have to decide, do I want to opt out now and postpone the inevitable? Because at some point, this You're piece of property is going to have to tie in. But for people from a cash flow standpoint, and they're not planning on moving, they're not planning on going anywhere. I, I can't afford $300 a month right now. My <laughs> system's you know, three years old, four years old. Give them an opt out. Right. They're okay. They're still going to pay the $55 a month like everybody else. But they avoid yeah. this temporarily. Right. Yeah, I'm just thinking temporarily might give someone an opportunity to save save some, yeah. some money to pay yeah. it. Or, 
or may we may be able just to just to the board's just in the few meetings that we've had you know these are exactly some of the points that people have been making yeah. and the concerns that they've raised you know the cash flow the people's household cash flow is certainly going to be impacted and for those that have been the long-term residents and they don't have a you know it's not a business uh, proposition for them uh, this is true concern and i explained you know we're not here to sell them on anything we're here to listen and part of the feedback has been you know the the impact on um, you know, first of all, the affordability for the for the, those that are going to be bettered, you know, the exact examples that you're talking about. Uh, also, the the betterment assessment, you know, so this single family home if it's forty six thousand dollars, what does that do to the equity of the people's home right now? And depending upon where they live, it's significant. Yeah. You know, it's a significant portion of their equity because as that property is sold, that immediate betterment gets paid off over time. So, but if they get an opt out, there is no betterment at this point, and the next person has to worry about it. So, these are some of the concerns that people were raising right off the bat. Yeah. And from a fairness standpoint, people who aren't even, we've heard from people who don't live in the bed, in this bedded area, this district, and they're concerned about the impact on the members of the community, just those exact people we're talking about. And they say, you know, I'm willing to take more of a hit, hit me with a thousand instead of 660. If it allows more people to stay in their home and residence right now, um, temporarily, you know, until this system fails. So these are all the things we're starting to hear as we get out there. And legitimate concerns, uh, some of them very personal, some of them uh, concerned for their neighbors, and others are just, you know, from a cash flow standpoint, how's it going to work? And to the same extent, uh, concerns raised where we're going to have bills to pay and we're going to be temporarily financing part of this project over a period of time where there's no system usage yet. The system's not up and operable. So the first three years, two, three years, you know, that you're paying on it, people are going to be bettered and still not have the benefit of it. People are going to start paying on their taxes, increasing their taxes over a short period of time before it's even completed. You know, so how can we smooth these bubbles out, address these concerns? What resources are we going to have to uh, service the debt you know, do you use some of the poultry money and what other resources do we have? So all things we're starting to hear about. Yeah, all things important. I know we weren't doing it, so Q &A, it all comes but... down to these are the decisions that the decision that this board makes. Right. It's all, all impact those things. Yeah, sure. Mr. Walmart. Can I just ask, can you just go back a few slides where you show the um, Title V versus the uh, uh, current use, and it was the 66% was on the left side of the park. Show sure. going back. Yeah, 66. So it looks like the residents would benefit. I, I was all about the current water use method because you can't argue with history because they're this, right? But then I look at this chart, and it looks like the residents take a bigger hit. Am I right when I say that? To take a bigger hit under the current water use method versus commercial? Uh, you're, you're correct on that. Go to the next chat. So what, what am I missing there? Why wouldn't that be a better deal than for the residents? Because the commercial are going to probably benefit from it more than... What am I missing? Help me. Let's try to find So uh, there are three methods, the water, the actual water use and the Title V current build, and then the Title V uh, highest and in, in best, I guess. Um, and so the highest, it was the highest and best that sort of uh, really threw uh, the numbers out of whack as far as, you know, uh, how much water capacity we would have to, to um, serve the highest and best. So really we came down to the water use and the Title V current build. Right. This model is just based on water use. It, you certainly could choose to go with Title V as well. And, and it no, would be a slightly a lesser cost on that, it looks like, for residential. I, but, you know, but the percentage of residential is higher than commercial. So I, I, we don't have the chart in here that actually shows the numbers. Yeah, no, I did um, peer down the, uh, right. the presentation a little bit. So we, we don't have to answer that now. That's just yeah. something we'll, that we'll take that a note. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get it. I was on with you know history because they you can't argue with history, but then I saw this and I was like, oh wait a minute, I know commercials can make out better than residents as far as equity of the property is concerned. And so, you know, that would be an issue that comes from the future. Sure. Yeah, so, we'll, get that, we'll get that too. I don't I don't know if that I mean because if I think if 
Well, we don't even have to debate that right now. This is just, I know this is for, we're, we're definitely getting into more questions. Than, it's good though, you asked us to think about it. No, I mean, that, that's why we're here, right? Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm glad we're able to have the conversation. Yeah. And I think it's important too, to just someone to be keeping a list of these questions and because they're not, we're not going to be the only ones asking. I think they have an FAQ going on with their proposals now. I think every time somebody asks a question, we're we've added in the back. So yeah, we're, we're capturing that for sure. Yes. Three, three or four slides worth great. of, of yeah. questions that's and great. answers now that we're working on. Great, that's great. They will debut tomorrow night. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, I, I think so. I think we're getting pretty much you know near the end here. Um, I did want to spend a little bit of time, if we have it, um, on the um, Warren article. So, Madam Chair, just before we get to the Warren article. I think we have a 745 um, We do in the hearing. I know he's here, thank you. <laughs> we have a 745 um, hearing. I, I just want to just highlight though the issue of the special legislation because it's really important to the financing model we're talking about. At a minimum, I think we, meaning Mr. Barisi, myself, Mr. Studo, Mr. O'Leary, are recommending that the ability to assess the compensatory privilege fees is really important because we know that there are properties along the route that are highly likely to be developed and to use more water and wastewater capacity than they are currently using. So from, a, again, that fairness standpoint, I think that we're really strongly urging the board to go forward with that as special legislation. I think that's the easier of the ones. The, the, the second is the residential opt-out, or as we heard from um, one member of the school committee tonight, a residential opt-in. It's another thing that's been brought forward. So rather than someone having to actively say, nope, I don't want to be part of this. I have a residential property, but I'm not looking to connect. Turning it to become, I'm not, the residential properties are not going to be part of it. And instead you have a residential opt-in. So the discussion that you're bringing to the, to the community is about a, a tax levy implication of $1,080 that starts to come down as residential properties, including condos, opt into it. So that's also something I think we may want to you know, consider whether that's the right way to structure this or not. I don't know. Um, that's really a policy decision for us to make, but that would require special legislation in order to do that. The other thing that would require special legislation um, is relative to properties that recently constructed a uh, septic system. I know that question came up at the October town meeting, I think last year, or maybe it was a June town meeting this past year. But if we were looking to do something that was sort of outside of what state law requires, it's possible that we need legislative approval. We need to file for that um, authorization as well. So that's three potential items that would be a, a special act that we would file, but ultimately would need to get approved at the state level. And I think we have a good indication that we will have latitude in, in going forward, but that's something that would be out there. And, and forgive me, but there's a fourth item that's special legislation relevant that I can't think of, Joe. Okay, I thought we, can, we probably should be aware of another 20 meters. What's that? We have another 20 meters, so. <laughs> so I, again, just something else that, you know, where as, as we get into this, to, to the Warren article, it's something we're going to need authorization from town meeting as well to file that legislation. And based on the legislative timing, my, sus my suspicion is it'll get filed for the 2023-2024 session because there's an election coming up and it would be ultimately considered, um, you know, for approval sometime, you know, the middle of next year at the earliest. So I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I know the hour is late, but I just, you know, those are things, again, we should just continue to think about. Joe, I know you have the one article language there. Right? Yeah, so just, you know, we'll, we'll quickly, we'll just say that, you know, we're working with uh, KP Law to, to sort of draft up some language, but, uh, and, you know, so it has the typical, um, you know, borrowing language in there, and it also covers, um, you know, the possibility of borrowing from, uh, for, you know, from SRF funding, which would be a lesser interest rate. Um, but in addition to that, there's some language that's incorporated into it for the special legislation. And I don't think you'll see the opt-out in here just yet, but the, 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 this is a work in progress and we'll continue to do that within the next couple of weeks or whenever the select board meets next to discuss this, we'll have it in a better state. So there's... Most importantly though, the way this is written, 
right now, if, at least for tonight's discussion, is it is a contingent appropriation, meaning that while the authorization to borrow and to appropriate the funding at town meeting would take place, it's written here contingent upon approval of a debt exclusion um, vote that the whole town would have to do. And the reason for that is because I think all, all of us, myself, Mr. Parisi, certainly Ms. Rourke, uh, Mrs. Studo, Mr. O'Leary, we're, we don't see that the town's budget within the limits of Proposition 2.5 has the ability to absorb the debt service payments associated for it. So you could do this as a project without such a vote, meaning just appropriate the money and authorize it to borrow and consider excluding the payment at a later point in time. The law allows you to do that, um, but it would be very difficult for the finance director and I to say that we could tell you how we're going to pay for that within the current tax levy. I know that's a sensitive subject with regard to this issue, but I, I, I do, I, I guess we, I think I wanna make sure that Mr. Parisi and I and Ms. Rourke, as she becomes more involved, are, are sort of heading in the right direction based upon the discussions we've had. Um, I'm kind of looking to Mr. Studo and Mr. O'Leary to agree that that's the- well, you're looking for the, Like, the is that the way we came, we came at it? It's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> And what, what, excuse me, Mr. Keller. Could you go back to the slide on uh, the better, yeah. the sewer resident? Yeah. In addition to these costs, would there also be a usage cost? And what would that be based on? So there would be typically a, a sewer enterprise fund set up, and that would be uh, covering, um, to cover the operational expenses of that enterprise, there would be a, a, a rate. You can do it uh, per a thousand gallons of usage. It would be based upon the use of water. Water, yeah. Water typically, it's water usage. There are meters that can be set up for deducting uh, irrigation water use, but but yes, it will be based on you know water that's uh, taken into the property and ultimately uh, discharged into the uh, sewer line. Is there any way of estimating averages on that? Or? I mean. You can look at other communities that may be similar. I mean, we have, uh, we don't have our own sewer plant. It'll be, you know, uh, part of the, um, you know, cost tying into the GLSD perhaps, or the annual or you know, monthly cost. You know, Matt's got some comment to offer too. To you, Madam Chair, our consultant right here. Can I, I look at, Madam Chair, I looked at recent rates knowing that this question came up last week in between the GLS communities, which are Drake it, well, I mean, Drake it, Methuen, and over in North Andover and Lawrence, and then looking at some of the surrounding communities, like Winchester, Woburn, Tewkesbury, et cetera, it ranged anywhere between <coughs> just over $3 per 100 cubic feet, which is equivalent to 748 gallons, up to, somebody was up to like $15 per 748 gallons of use. So it's all over the map and it all depends on the use of the operation of the collection system in the pump station in the town and then also if we're discharging through north and over there be a fee there associated that would be tapped on because they're treating our waste your wastewater as you go through. So it's a wide range and there's no like pinpointing at this point. So, but that is something, wouldn't the board be setting the rate or, I mean, just like we would with the, the tax Yes, rate. but you probably have to find out like how much the electricity and heating and chemicals and everything as the system starts up, you have to make an initial estimate and then fine tune it as it goes along. Mr. But, Keller? But yes, there would be a yeah, the other one is that that's a cost Thank you. That, Thank cost you. they don't currently have, so it would be a I think important for residents that are opting in to have some sense of you've got the the, the increase in tax, you've got the uh, the payment of the benefit, then the next time would be what 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 is it cost? So we're using right. yeah. yeah. in, in addition to that, there's also the tie-in cost. The hookup, yeah. So the hookup costs. Yeah. So depending upon how far you are away from the sewer line, how big of a trench do you have to if the septic system is out in the back of your property, you have to change the plumbing inside your house to bring it to the front of the property. Those those costs, those additional costs for the tie-in are again on the homeowner. 
And also, I think everybody's figured out by now that a lot of these costs, um, you know, <laughs> the person that has it second is going to benefit a lot more, right? You don't have a septic, so you have sewer, but you were the person who paid for, you know, let's say somebody down the line. And also, though, it's something where, again, when you when we start, tonight's not the night for it, but because we're not getting to her there, but the point is that this is how you grow. That's just a case in point. I mean, it's like, and no one has yet, out of all the meetings we've had, no one has disputed that fact, proponents and people against it, that there's no way to grow. So I feel like this is one of the costs, and that's why we're not hiding them. We're putting them out there. Thank you for even putting that one out, where this is what it's going to cost. And again, I think somebody said it before, if you don't plan on monetizing, right, it's a more bitter pill to swallow. And that's why, you know, specific reasons to opt out may work in your favor to the detriment, of course, to everyone else, you know, because of the numbers. But it's, again, something to note that, you know, there is no there's no getting around that at first, especially this is going to cost money, you know, and the idea that within three to five years, like unless you sell to somebody who wants to develop, you're going to recover. It's just not going to happen. So that it, it's just good to like to say that, like, you know, so no one comes back if it ever does go through and it's like, hey, you never told me. So uh, but I also say and I cannot take up too much time, but when you look at communities that have done it and by the way, North Reading has now become the exception. Look around. We are one of the last ones that have not developed their main street. That's fact. So now it's not that, oh, man, we want to be pioneers. No, we are not pioneers. We are behind by decades. So let that sink in that every other community did it and no one went bankrupt doing it, just in case anybody was wondering if that could ever happen. So. Well, we really are the pioneers with those, you know, horse and carriages and everything. Oh, sure. Are you all set, Mr. Mrs. Herbert, did you have any question or? No, you could. <laughs> you have some comments. I can tell, but <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Was that that would that would be um, the end of my presentation. Can you can you factor these in again? Their questions, but I think it's a great thing to factor into these slides. That you know, it even though it makes sense because you've been working on it. I think maybe that those are the other points that could be made. This is just for the cost of the project not those other costs that are will will be they'll be incurred but i would imagine we would be doing it the same way where we get the presentation for the water enterprise and we're trying to determine the rate every year based mm -hmm. on the cost based on the reserves i imagine we would be going through that very same exercise maybe not we or me but the board would be going through that same exercise mm -hmm when it finally does come to fruition if and when it finally does come to fruition that we'll have to factor in what the cost will be etc so that, that's what i would think setting a rate just like we have to set the water rate based on the cost of the providing the service and is there anything else you wanted to add i know we weren't supposed to even ask you questions but i'm glad you're answering them on you have Right, Pierce here to help yeah. out too. I, I think, Madam Chair, this is the type of interaction we wanted. You know, I right. think we wanted to just really get that these issues out there for everyone to be thinking about them. Yeah, right. You know, and we we do have an extensive list of frequently asked questions that we'll be adding, including oh, yeah. the things that were brought up here, uh, namely the operating costs that households would face um, year in and year out. So that's great. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving, on. Should we, should, do you have anything else? Oh, do, you have, do you want a water? All right, thank you. So we'll move, we'll move on to our next order of business? Yes. Which is? The public hearing, public hearing at full position, yeah. So we're gonna be talking to, um, no, should we do that next? Jump out of order? I think we should do the hearing. Yeah, do the hearing. We're going to call the public hearing. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, the joint petition for RMLD Verizon plan number 1958 install a new pole on Haverhill Street. 
Welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Dan Trent. I work for the Town of Red Municipal Light. I'm here tonight to request a bill to be located in the public way, 114-1 uh, Haverhill Street, North Reading, approximately three feet off the edge of the existing roadway and approximately 89 feet northeasterly from the existing pole, 113.5 Haverhill Street, located approximately 36 feet southeasterly from the existing pole, 114 Haverhill Street on the easterly side of Haverhill Street. If there's any questions, I'll be more Just give us one second. Sure, sure. Watch this happen. Madam Chair, I think I can put it right up on Mary and Liz. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Deb's in front of you, too. Thanks. Everyone wasn't here for this. Can we Verizon see thing? Everybody <laughs> there? I just. Snail biting, but I'm going to pick it up. I'm just glad. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do we have the location <laughs> or any kind of a? Can we look at that? I have an image I'll put up there. Okay, yeah, because I can't find it. In the I'm sorry. The, the location is on Haverhill Street at North Street near uh, the way known as Amber Road. Haverhill and North. Haverhill and North. Haverhill and North and across the street that dirt road Amberwood. And the image I'm going to put up there. Um, We'll show you the location, although it's kind of oriented funny. All right, so it should be up on the screen. Oh, coming up on the screen. Yeah. So my understanding is that there is a pole right here where my hand is. That's correct. So you're going to construct a pole on the other side of the street? Yes. With a guy? Skyline, yeah, that will that will go across Haverhill Street. That's correct. And then it will tie down on the ground on the other side of the pole. Yes. Um, I know from this image it looks like the pole's in the middle of the street, it's but wrong. it's just the way right. is very wide at that spot. Correct. 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 Um, so this is sort of a forested area over here. Um, there's wait. been some tree removal and brush cutting that DPW has done over the years. I think in this spot, so it's a little <coughs> bit bare than it has been. Um, this is I know been a problematic area over the years. There's a pretty there's a pole on the other side that Verizon has, I think, with you guys with a pretty substantial fiber optic thing going on. There's a big box on the side of it. It got hit by a car and the fiber optic was out for a while. So there's a lot going on at this intersection, admittedly, and the sight lines are not great. But I think what you're trying to do is hold up this pole over here on the other side. Those right. guys. Okay. How come this doesn't depict? I can does show it you. Does it depict all the other poles? And it does. So there's a pole right here on the <laughs> southbound side of Haverhill Street right before you take the turn onto North Street. So if you were at the Hood School coming south and turning right on the North Street, you go around the one pole here. The pole I just mentioned is right over here. It's got a pretty significant green box on it that you really can't miss. And it became much more noticeable when it got hit by a car and the box was hanging off of the pole <laughs> for a while. Um, it did eventually get corrected. Um, we also had a sidewalk installation project in this vicinity that went from North Street down to Eisenhower Road, I believe. Eisenhower, yeah. Eisenhower Lane, excuse me. Um, but the most notable thing is they're looking across Haverhill Street with a guy. It, it's not ideal. What is a guy? It's a wire and, and that goes from one pole to the other to hold it. I'm sorry, he should probably be answering yeah. this question. Yes. But. <laughs> Support the pole. Like, is there going to be a guy standing there? No, no. <laughs> It's above the roadway to support the pole. I'm going to show you what, what, what Why would you need that? Why do you need that? Uh, Is the right pole now, falling down? The pole is starting to shift with time. So why don't they just take it down and put a new one? This is just going to support the pole. But it looks so down. messy and sloppy. If, if that's what it's going to end up looking like, there's a lot of poles like that around the place that are shifting and moving, and it looks so sloppy. Why isn't why isn't RMLD just going to replace it and put up a new, stronger, sturdier pole? So, <laughs> this is Juan Bryant. He's with the Red Municipal as well. Nice to see you again. Yeah, I know. So that is new here, and yeah. so I'm kind of backing him up. Oh, I so this is a one of the major poles that feeds North Hebrew Street down Marvelous to Castle and Christian Drive. Mm -hmm. um, this pole has a large um, uh, rise and jump line that's kind of tipping the pole towards. Yeah, take it off. Street. Get it off. I would love that's them, a safety problem. But we do need communications going down North Street and up Avery Street, and that's what that line is doing. 
I get that, but not if it's making a pole tilt over and it's becoming a safety issue. Right, but then we can back anchor that pole with another one and it helps to keep the pole straight. But it makes a mess in the road. I it makes a mess for residents. Would be to go on the ground. And that's usually a very costly issue, um, not just for um, the communications company, but also for the residents who's going to pass those costs back on to communication companies going to pass those costs back on to the residents. Well, shame on RMLD because they're making money from the communications company leasing their pole to them. Oh, uh, no, we don't. It's a joint ownership. So, then both of you, I should, pole. both of you should be responsible for fixing this. I see poles like this all <laughs> over the place. They look like they're going to fall into the road. Right. And we live with it. We're here living with that and concerned about that. It should be fixed, not a structure like that or extra apparatus on it covering the street covering the street over there should be a better solution done if it's a more costly solution you can't tell me the communications company isn't making money with their apparatus their equipment on there mr gilberto just to that point we've had this come up in the past with central street yep. and avoided the mess. guy situation by going with a brace yes is a brace in this location an option and, and you know what what might that look like for us at this intersection? A brace would probably be uh, a little bit messier. The, 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 if you look at the plan, this kind of cuts across that little corner going towards North Street. In order to brace that in the upper right direction, that push brace is going to have to face that way um, across that property line right there between the corner of Haverhill Street and North Street right there. And that's, that's where you're going to have a little bit of a issue kind of fitting that push, push brace pole um, going 30 feet up the pole coming down probably about 20 feet to the ground um, i think that pretty be potential significant high school um, to the area right there versus a pole going with a guy wire across the street and being anchored on the other side and we did the same thing at um central street the last time i was here and we kind of um replaced that option with the, the push brace option, I don't know the gentleman on the other side he was not happy with it because now he has a structure coming down on the side of his own that's a lot more, you know, her potential revealing to his property because it's actually not a pole. Right, on the side right. There has to be a better way to do this. And sometimes they're in the, that <coughs> intersection is a, is a busy intersection and sometimes it's in the line of sight. Some of these poles are directly in the line of sight when you're trying to pull out onto these intersections. And they, it just, it has right, to be a better where, way. Where this push brace is, the only effective line of sight would it be if you're coming out of Amber Road and then the, the vehicles coming down will be coming from the south side of Avril Street going to the north side and that wouldn't affect line of sight coming out of Amber Road. No, you can't see anyway because there's a big outcropping of <laughs> Rock. You can't see. When you're coming out of Amber Road and looking south, you can't see anyway because it's it's all ledge. But this pole is on the north side. I know it's on the north side. Yes. So I mean yeah. so as far as impacting the, the sight lines from coming out of Amber Road and looking south, it can't be any worse. But so and I understand this is north of that. It is north of that. Yeah, I know it's but it, I know it's north of that, but it's, Do you uh, have a picture, Mr. Gilbert? Yeah, I can put up an image that shows an aerial view that might be a little bit Good. more that, helpful. Might be a better angle. We'll start with the GIS, and if we need the street view, we can look to do that. <clears throat> Which will be in that middle of the. So, this is as far in as I can zoom. But my understanding is mm -hmm. that the a leaning pole is here. You're looking to tie a guy across yes, over yes. here. The one I was talking about that got struck by the car is over here to the south. Mm -hmm. um, a brace, I assume, would need to go from the road west along North yeah. Street. So that line is actually a little bit more south coming across the street to North Street, the telephone line. Mm -hmm. Nope. So it's going across from... Right here. Uh, if you go a little bit more to your left. Yep. That pole is a little bit more to your left. 
keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Keep on going. Oh, okay, right that's here. about right there. Yeah. Yep. That's where that other telephone pole is. So that push brace would have to go from Havel Street going towards the, to where that pole is in order to back anchor that or um, reverse anchor. Again, I don't know that a foot brace is even acceptable. I'm just identifying something we've done in other scenarios. <laughs> However, the, where the, the pole that needs to be braced up there are supporting the, the land right area, there. the right of way is significant, right? As far as uh, town owned land. Aligns. It's, not, it's not a great alignment, unfortunately. Okay, so you've got a significant unused land area right there. Right, but that that um, brace would not be going um, ninety degrees with um, Avril Street. No, it, it would be, be it would be going perfectly exactly. to, to, to yeah. North Street with the other pole it's pulling on, right? Yeah. So it would be going so, well, uh, so angular from North, northeast to southwest. Right. What's wrong with that? Got, I got well, I, I, I'm right. now picturing. I'm now picturing more the area. The pole. There's a significant pine tree here, and the the wires are actually behind the pine tree, right? Yes, the right. Fish, it feeds through the tree line. So it cuts. It cuts across over the North Street. So, would that not be a not potential um, masking of a, a brace since there's already growth there? I mean, I, I don't. I don't know. I, again, whether that's even acceptable, I don't know. But I mean, that will also have the petition as well. Sure. No, I understand, and that's what happened so, with the Central Street. So if that's you mean petition, you mean petition us? Yes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> my guess is we probably consider it, but <laughs> just a guess. When uh, you say going underground would be a considerable cost and put on to the users, do you mean of just that area? No. No. No, so it would be spread out, out, all, be spread through out all through town. I mean, it might end up to be a very minimal cost, but it's. You know. Yeah, I mean, that's something we can always present with Verizon. Um, yeah. Because it's their cable. You know, we're just joint owners in the system. And because we represent the ownership in North Reading, we're the ones that are here to petition for the poll. Um, but as far as them agreeing to take their wires underground mm -hmm. and what that cost is and how they pass it on, that's something we'd have to relay on to them. Um, for, our, for us, whenever we take on costs like that, it gets spread out and yeah. it's also something that we use to, you know, keep rates down and stuff like that. Right, but you've been beat over the head before, you know, by, <laughs> you know as, as far as this goes, you know, we, we have an aversion to crossing streets. Absolutely. With, with, Wires and guy wires, you know, it's just, and if it can be avoided, it should be. Yes. And if there's some additional costs associated with it that everybody has to share, yeah. and again, over the entire community, the cost sharing is pretty small. Yeah. And the benefits are significant because when that pine tree falls right. and it's buried, it won't take out any, any power, right? Generally speaking. Yeah. As long as it goes yeah. towards North Street and not Hebrew Street. Right, yeah. right, right. I think it's worth it. No, but I mean, so it's either that or the brace. Um, and again, it appears to be enough land area there in the right of way to. Yes, I, to, I think I measured it out to a 40 foot right of way. We can probably do some measurements and see if that's in yeah, the town that's right away. Yeah, where yeah. the push base will be, or it will be on private property. And I think he's got the street yeah. up right there. Yeah, just the so yeah. There's the wires coming right there. Yeah. yeah, those are the wires going across the North Street. It just right. was so messy. And again, the weight of those wires and everything that's on the other pole is pulling that other one. That's correct. It's just so messy. So you're looking yeah. to go from this pole across and down? Yeah. It just sounds like that. So if you went at that corner, the Havel Street North Street corner right there, if it's in town's property, then you know, it's we'll petition the town. Get it on somebody's private property that would be very difficult to review. Yeah. Well, well we can we can the whole pool and get it out of the side. We can rent the the, we can yeah. rent some That's space to you. <laughs> we, we can rent some space to for a brace to you. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, I mean, there are wires coming off this pole running north-south. What what wires so are running messy. behind this pine tree? That's the telephone wire. Mm -hmm. Communications wire. Communications only? That's correct. Not electric? No. It, I mean, is it looks like there's something going on with the communications connection here as well. That's also correct. They have the same it's type of mid-span connection <laughs> as the so RWE. Nice. It's so messy. I mean, I, I guess, wh why can't we take what's going through the woods here and pull on this pole and, and get it on the main line of North Street going north south with everything else? I'm not sure because that looks like a lower line. So if you go over to the North Street side on the street view, you can see where that line connects. And I'm not sure why they can't pick a mid-span mid -span tap off of that. Look, um, it's not the telephone wire that's pulling the pole. It is. The it is. is. There's no that, electric yet. That, but that's that's causing the. So telephone has they have more weights than we do because they still have their old copper lines. I, I just want Madam Chair through you just to confirm that. So I, it looks like this is a fiber optic cable. Did yeah. I see that correctly? No, none of these are electric. Is that is no? They're probably the old copper um, communications lines. If they're fiber, they have no, not much weight on them. Sure. Again, I, it looks like it was helpless. It, there's there's got to be 15 wires over there that are going to a south, and there's so these three that are causing yeah. motion. Right, because we, we ran we ran our wires down. Yeah, all the way across. They tap across. Yeah. They they cut across there on um, um, North Street to Haverhill Street um, with that um, with their connections. It, I, Madam Chair, I so why I can't would, they fix it? <laughs> Why can't they run along, you know? The last time you asked but they had the same direction. Had the same, had the same direction as everybody else. Yeah, but know, yeah. instead of pulling against everything. They're co-owned, you said it yourself. So if that's what you have to do to get them to fix it. Didn't we have to get rid of our copper communications wires? Wasn't that um, we, no longer serviceable for they us? They were taken down by Verizon. Yes, we didn't I, I to remember take, that. Take yeah. They were taken down. We were no longer able to use that as our communications I, I, line. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge benefit to us if they take down the copper lines. It's, you know, it's a lot of, it takes a, puts a lot, a lot more stress and a lot more weight on the pole, especially when they're converting over to it. Right. And not to prolong the conversation, Matthew, but there's a, a guy right here that is tied into the pole. Why, why is that? So as you see, they have a line coming down from so messy. Um, the so messy. western side of North Street that dead ends on that line. That line has to be back anchored. Okay. Fortunately, the line going across from um, North Street to Haverhill Street, it doesn't have an anchor on it. <laughs> if we run an analysis on that, it would also require an anchor just has the pole over and on Maple Street. And it's just one of those things that once you touch it and you run the analysis, then you have to make the adjustments because we can't run the analysis and says, okay, the pole is failing because it needs an anchor and not pull on oh, it. It's only gonna need an anchor if you leave that wire up on up on there pulling on it, right? Because it's got it's being pulled back the other way towards towards Maple Street already. It's it's, it, no, it's being pulled towards uh, Main Street. Okay. So, so the, the, it's being pulled towards Main Street. So it's got a back, they have a back anchor on that. I the see. The telephone yes. does. Now the one going from um, North Street to Haverhill Street, that does not have an anchor on it. And if I was supposed to do anything with that pole, I would have to run an analysis on it. And once I run an analysis on it, it's going to require me to anchor that pole, which means that I will have to either get a. Um, Depends on how far the distance is. If it's in a town right away, we have the ability to put it there. But if we require an anchor at this specific pole and it goes back on the, co the customer's property, then we're going to require an easement from the customer. So when, that's not what I'm suggesting. Do you, Madam Chair? That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is really redirecting these lines that are pulling on this pole and pulling on the pole you wish to put a guy on back on the north-south main line with Abel. And to go all the way down to Abel Street and then mid span over there. So you want to take that wire off from going um, that 45 degree angle over to that pole and go straight down to the center right there. I imagine straight to the pole at the corner of Amber and Haverhill. Right? There's, no, there's no, no there's pole a, right there. We are mid-span right there. No, 
there, there's two, there's one across from the end of North Street, and then there's one just south with the big green box on it. Right? There's a pole right here, and there's a pole right over there. Yes. So they, they'd have to have a mid span connection right there. So they have to feed that pole from all the way down North Street across Avril Street, and then somehow tap into another line. I'm not sure how they would do that. We'd have to refer to that. I, I just, I'm, again, I'm no, just noticing that it's not all, all the wires going through that cutoff. It's just somebody's communication wire that the rest of the wires are all going to the cell phone. Right, because you got Verizon's probably got two communication lines. This is how they usually run. They run two communication lines, and then Comcast may have one. <laughs> so this poll analysis is done with three communications. Jump in, Mr. Walner. Just a quick question. I mean, wood's going to bend over, you know, over stress, right? But what if you replaced it with uh, steel or aluminum, whatever they use for the poles? I mean, can you just replace that pole? With like a steel or aluminum pole? Yeah, like what they use in intersections. I mean, they don't use wood in intersections. They use real poles that don't bend and you don't need any braces or guiders or anything else like that because they're anchored in the ground. Yeah, so, we, we do have, um, potentially use a laminated pole. Um, they do require a bit of excavating um, down into the, the- Yeah, you have to dig deep, I mean, you have to- Yeah, you have to dig a little deeper, you have to backfill with concrete and fill. Yeah, but it's not gonna bend. Maybe you can get it out of the sidewalk at the same time. Because if you get that out of the sidewalk, then you're going to reverse corner the other pole down the street, then you're going to have a potential problem down there because between these two poles, it's a straight line. You want to keep everything in a straight line. As soon as you start moving one thing, then you start shifting the other, mm -hmm. and then you just start going down the line. And uh, I think it, adding all the, the, the communications wires is what's making the pole shift, isn't it? Yes. So if you removed those, wouldn't that stop it from what, what's happening or it's being pulled into the road? Yep, we sent this over to Verizon. They took a look at it. They signed off on it. They accepted the petition. They didn't have to go to Preston to remove their possible. wires. Of course not. No, <laughs> you, you, of course not. not. Why would you have to tell them, take your wires off, it's yeah. making the poll? No. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's joint ownership. They have as much right as we do to put their lines on the poles. Well, they have as much responsibility to make sure that the pole remains erect too. Yeah. So that if, is uh, correct. So if it's, gonna yeah. it's gonna be done safely. That's the same yeah. thing you told me the last time. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we meant it then and we mean it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of hard for us to get a hold of them and hard for them to get them here. They got a store um, in Reddit. So yes. <laughs> I'm pretty really sure that's a wireless free. store. That's, yeah. Yeah. Which would be but, preferable, wireless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we can go back, take a look at this, and um, put another request in the third door then to um, take another look at this. Yeah. See if they can potentially come up with a better solution. Wires. And I'd like to see those numbers if it went underground. Like, what, what kind of money are we talking? Okay, I'll you know put that request in as well. Um, but first, we'll start to see if they can actually do his might be his option might be a little bit simpler going across the end road if it's possible and then make the connection that way in Haverhill Street just like we all do um but I don't know you talking about so crossing Haverhill Street again right yeah yeah but we all cross Haverhill Street right now I know so um but we'll be on an existing pole versus a new pole right here which probably it, would, it would put additional like, stress on that pole. Well, then it have to be yeah, further exactly. embraced exactly. and all the rest, right? Yeah, but with that one, we have the ability to the back anchor on the back end versus, you know. It's already back anchor. Like, right? But this, with that, for the additional tension, we'll need a bigger anchor. But you, you bed here, and we're looking at this, and it looks like a crazy canopy of wires going every which yeah. way there. Yes. Let's, I, let's just... That I, I will just say that's absurd. Yeah. It's absurd that you need to put another wire across with because the, of wires that are already there pulling the pole that aren't even probably in use because yeah. we couldn't use them anymore. And that was going back, what, four or five years pre-COVID 
They are no longer going to be using them. Take them down. Remove so, some of this. It's, I don't understand it's not Why is it saying that they're not using the copper? This is for our fire alarm system. system. For your right? Fire they weren't, they weren't useful anymore. They were going to all different... Was, was going thousand dollar capital project because of it. So, so we're not worried about spending their money. <laughs> not at all. We have not much sympathy here. <laughs> oh yeah, I did that the last time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all right. That's why you said the new. Well, anyway, welcome, to yeah. our, <laughs> welcome to our, <laughs> welcome to our <laughs> meeting. We're gonna watch tonight. Thank you for being so <laughs> patient. It's, it's been very, you know, but we definitely will. And I'll put a lot of requests into them to take a second look at this. Please do. Um, out to and especially with the fact that they're saying that some a lot of these copper lines are not being used. For us, you know, it's hard for us to tell. You know, we, we are actually doing all the analysis, even though it's a joint ownership system. Yeah. So if we do the analysis and we see a problem, we can't, you know, we have to try to, you know, fix it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we're kind of here. Um, so what happens if that pole falls down in the road? and hits a car, or hits a pedestrian. What happens then? Because you it, see that it's, you see that it's going. The fact that it, it's, it's, it needs an anchor right now, it's an issue, but that's why we're here. That's why we're here. So, but it needs an anchor because you put too many wires up there and mm -hmm. you're asking to put yet more wires right, to compensate for the too many wires that are on it. Yes. So that is not upon us to say, sure, add another wire. It's actually absurd for us to say that when we know what we can see what's the cause of it. And I can understand why you don't show us the pictures because it's evident when we look at the pictures what's going on here. So okay. I think well, maybe just. I mean, we did, our intent was not to keep the pictures away from you. I mean, we. No, I know. No, I didn't no. say that, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I think it's helpful to see it. A picture tells the, the whole story versus the. The diagram with one line across. That's not what this looks like. Yeah, I think that's from past practice. We have to submit yes. those drawings with the yeah. petition, but normally they get submitted at that time. You know, the, the, the town will take a look at them and look at the area, and then at the meeting, right. they will make right. a determination. Right. right. Yeah, but adding another wire at Halloween time, you know, it just looks like a <laughs> bigger, you know, cobweb. But no. <laughs> Not, not, not too interesting. Okay. We have to have a better way of this. All right. We no, we'll, we'll, we'll keep at Verizon. And Please thanks do. for, thank you, know, you it, for, you, uh, have uh, you have our sympathy. Thank you. Talk to you soon. So do we want to take some action on this or what are we going to do? Well, are you going to, do you think you can come back? Are you going to come back? Should we continue it till you can come back? Or, I think we'll probably table it and oh, get table. a message over to them and then um, see what they say and if, they can do what we're thinking about, then they'll proceed, and then this will go away. Yes. And if they're requiring that we come back, then we will have to come back and hopefully come back with them. You perfect. Oh, yeah, no, we, we don't just want to see you. Yeah. No, no, no. We you have to see you. Us. I know, but if you have <laughs> to come to back, you, but... we don't want to see you without a representative from Verizon. Okay. All right. I, I speak for myself. <laughs> but my guess is <laughs> everybody else is the same. What happened? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll table right. table it until you. we see you again. Awesome. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good night. <laughs> okay. So that one it. that matter stands table. Can you still buy the seven thirteen? Um oh, Mark, you're hanging around for five. You, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark, you're hanging around to be resilient? Yeah, you are resilient. Yes. <laughs> All right, we should, which one are, which one are you here for? Oh, oh, that's number five. Let's oh. call that next item. North Shore Water Resiliency Task Force, vote to join signing agreement. Mr. Clark or Mr. Gilberto? You think we should join? I think so. So. <laughs> I know. Do we need a presentation on this no, one? Doing on so this is a, this is a group, and I've been involved kind of with these groups tangentially going back probably 25 years. It was an Ipswich River Task Force. We did a bunch of studies back in the 90s. We had USGSN did some fish studies, some flow studies, looked at what impact water and wastewater have on the Ipswich River being a low flow river. This is the current iteration of that. Um, a number of communities have already joined, including Andover. Andover was asked because they supply North Reading and have the potential to maybe supply additional communities. 
But they're looking at a number of different things. Uh, how to alleviate, and obviously this comes up more in the drought type years like we're in, how to alleviate the low flow situations in the Ipswich River. Um, Reading, Wilmington and North Reading have always been targeted because we're kind of the headwaters of the Ipswich River. So the f low flows are more uh, serious up in our neck of the woods. But they're looking at a variety of things, including uh, they're targeting Salem Beverly water supply, which has, seems to have a little bit of an abundance in their ability to supply water. There was a site identified in Topsfield for a, a reservoir going back probably 50 years now, and they're looking at the possibility of developing that as a water supply reservoir. And then they're looking at things as forward thinking as uh, desalination plants. So it's a, it's for me, it's a very interesting type of task force, but it's also something that uh, I think it benefits the town to have a seat at the table. We would be a voting member as a community. Um, obviously, we signed a 99-year agreement with Andover, but just to be present to remind people that as we move forward, if this wastewater project moves forward, remind people that North Reading's taken steps to alleviate or minimize our impact on low flows in the Ipswich River Basin. Um, just to have that seat at the table. Uh, so I, I, my my recommendation would be that we would join this this uh, committee. And Andover has joined, right? To my understanding, Andover has signed on uh, Reading, Wilmington, and all the communities downstream. Okay, questions, comments, votes? Um, yeah, just the... When was it that we participated in the discussion with Senator Tarr, Representative right. Jones? Oh, a year yeah. ago, probably. Maybe a year or so ago, I participated in a discussion that we can, uh, Senator Tarr is co-founder and chair of this ad hoc group right now and uh, was looking for participation. So I participated in the meeting. And again, it was interesting and I expressed to the Senator at the time and anyone else who was there that, you know, we're a net positive here as far as you know, right now we're getting all of our water from Ando, which is Merrimack River Basin, and putting it into the Ipswich and we've never really gotten recognition and credit for it. But I too believe it's important for us as this whole thing moves forward we have a seat at the table, understand what regionally everybody's thinking about doing and how it could, may impact us and have a, have a say. So I think it's important that we, uh, we participate. Right. Who would represent our town? Who would be the... Uh, uh, Mr. Clark. For probably the next several months, <laughs> it would be me. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no, you don't have to contribute financially to it. At this point, there's no, so they have obtained $100,000 in state funding to do study a couple of those issues that I mentioned. Um, at this point, there's no, and going back to 25 years, there's never been a financial burden to the towns. Okay. It's more, so it's it's the towns, it's kind of the uh, the watershed associations, and then it's the state, state reg, uh, legislature, and then like the Department of Environmental Protection, that regulators as well. So it's kind of a, a cobbled together group of uh various parties with various yeah, interests with, uh, various interest groups I mean, again, it, it's it's a good way of conduit to to get a diverse group of people together to discuss the issue as opposed to everybody doing their own little feet and things yeah so it's a, it's a good idea and again it, good point so, so that's how water systems have developed everyone's done their own little thing and then when you put all the pieces together it's like this probably wasn't in the best interest of the river as a whole um where it's fallen apart in the past has been recommendations have been developed that then have some serious price tags associated with it and everyone kind of <laughs> walks away from the table at that point. But I think I think it's important that we have a voice and stay involved and stay informed about the issues. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, do we have a motion? We do. Does, uh, does it include a pointing mark? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to vote to join and sign the North Shore Water Resiliency Task Force. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank Thanks you, Mark. for Thanks, Mark. hanging Thanks. with us tonight. All right, next order of <laughs> business is the appointment of the Economic Development Committee. Sure. That, one's, that one's easy, the Economic Development. Madam Chair, through you. So we had this on the agenda, but as I think the board knows, this is actually a liaison assignment that's made for this one seat on the Economic Development Committee. The other positions 
besides the Planning Commission member, are jointly appointed. So we've given the sheet, the, the appointment slip to the chair to sign off on. I think everyone knows the liaison assignment was Mrs. Gonzalez made in June and discussed with the board at that point in time. And there is an alternate member who I think has been jointly appointed, Mrs. Sudo, I believe. Is that correct? To have yes. That? Yeah. Okay. I'm everywhere. Great. So we had it on the agenda, but it's actually a liaison appointment, um, which we gave to the chair of the site. So yes. I apologize for that. Right? Yeah. Being on the agenda. I didn't think we had a motion on that. So. We did not have a motion. No. Okay. Next order of business is to discuss establishing the transportation committee. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. And um, this is a follow-up to a conversation, um, both I think here and then between myself, um, Ms. Hartman, the uh, public services director, and Mr. Walner um, concerning uh, needs regarding transportation. Um, there was a document that Mr. Walner put together and I think Ms. Hartman had reviewed that we put in the packet to I think kind of kick off the discussion um, and ultimately, I think we're looking for the board to consider appointing a, or, or creating a committee that would be to which would be appointed to address transportation issues. Um, for transportation planning, we customarily had relied on the town planner um, for studies and information like that. But the, I've asked the public services director to take a more active role now that the position's been created, and because of the intent to really address the needs of the folks served by the departments that fall under her purview. So, I know she's here this evening. Lily, are you there? I'm here. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you loud and clear. So I, I don't know, I miss Madam Chair through you. I don't know if Mr. Warren wants to add anything I'll to just, it. Or... You know, I think you've been hearing me talk about this before. We talked about our strategic meeting. Right now, I'm a liaison for MBRTA, MBTA. You know, you have Council of Aging doing their own transportation thing. You have vet services that sometimes drive their people around using their own cars. <laughs> you know, we're all kind of scattered, but one of the major problems, especially for seniors in our town, is property taxes and transportation. And so this would be an effort to create a group that is focused entirely on transportation. They would be um, going to other towns to establish best practices. They would be interacting with um, MBTA and BRTA, all the resources they can find, and try to come up with solutions that would hit the large swath of people and not have counts of aging doing their own thing and, you know, after school transportation for the kids, scrambling to do their own thing, it would create a, you know, a town network of transportation. So I think it's, you know, there's some key players in here that would, would be part of the committee. I think it, it's timely for us to do that. I think it's a, a strong committee would have a huge benefit for us. So, we want that. so that's where it came from. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Lil may want to, Ms. Hardman may want to add to it as well. And is it proposing? <laughs> so initially the, the work of the committee would be to study this issue and see how we can have a consolidated transportation plan? Yeah, best, yeah. again, best practices. You know, study other towns, what are other towns doing? What are our needs in town? And how can we create a good system for ourselves? And um, so the nature of the committee would be as an advisory committee to yes, the select the board for anything. Correct. I mean, and I think you have to, I think you have to not consider school in the equation because they may have vendors providing that service and they, they have other requirements specific to transportation of minors and those types of things that that don't sew into the general population of transportation yeah. here. Yeah, that may, that may but happen. but it's worthy of taking a look at just to eliminate or you know yeah think something like that but okay so do we have a motion related to we, it? We didn't, didn't have a motion. It wasn't quite put into the specific um, okay. format that we would approve it in. But I think for me, I was looking for some feedback here to get it to yeah, that point in time. Sure. You know, one thing I will note is I you know, talked with Ms. Hartman and I think, you know, my, my expectation is that she would play an active role with regard to this. Um, we have a couple of other positions or, or departments that are represented, Council on Aging and, and Veterans in particular. I think from our perspective, it would be great to get members of the committees that work with that group to be part of it, rather than the, the staff to the extent possible. I don't know if you have a, an well, issue. I'm sorry. So for Council on Aging and Veteran Services, from my perspective, we get a member of the Veteran Services Committee yes. to get actively yeah. involved rather Stay than home. the director. And the yes. same for Elder Services, especially as we're coming up to speed. I think that the, I think the staff can be adequately covered by, by, Ms., uh, by Ms. Hartman, but if we could get, um, and we're, we're, we're still working through getting the Council on Aging fully staffed up so that 
that's an issue unto itself. But that's sort of the thinking that, that we were having. Sure. Um, I mean, this is, do you want to maybe put some sketch of it or do you want to talk about, did you have something in mind to talk about this evening or do you want to, you mean, do you mean, want what to? I, what I wrote on this. Yes. This and and you, that's what you think. How many members would be? Uh, well, I'm suggesting we also include, so, you know, um, two to four residents, depending, you know, we got to keep it not a number. Uh, somebody from Council of Aging, somebody from Vet Services, Public Services Director who would take a pretty significant role, and probably a select board liaison. So I think we're talking seven, you know, uh, seven, yeah. about seven people. A little planning commission. Uh, Pepper should be on here as well. You should probably keep it not to that many, but smaller, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, that can be, you know, flushed yeah. out and we figure that out. All right. So some members essentially designated from the various committees themselves choosing a member to help serve on this yes. committee. Right. And then the two resident members, we would pick those resident members. Yeah. The select they would board would. For a committee. They would, they would okay. apply for it and we would help them. Okay. And it's an ad hoc, a specific mission to, to take a look at this and make some recommendations. Yeah, I actually see this being a perpetual committee. I see this having a very long life. This transportation okay. is always an issue. And okay. um, I'll even add that the uh, Commission on Disabilities, we met last week and we actually brought in a, um, a person who does surveys to kind of advise us. And uh, as we started going through it, you know, there's like six, 700 vets in town. You know, there is a, uh, each, uh, you know, the kids in schools, I know you're not supposed to talk about the kids, but in the schools, 19% of the kids have self-identified as having some disability that affects their lives. Transportation is gonna be a key issue in there. You start talking seniors, you're talking a population of 2,500, 500 that live in their in their homes by themselves and maybe can't drive. So we're planning to actually, sooner than later, create a survey to get all those different demographics mm -hmm. to actually, part of that survey will include transportation needs for their specific thing. So I think at the end of the day, this is gonna be a transportation okay. community that lives on forever because I think you're always gonna need so great. We, I do too. It kind of checks off a lot of the yeah, strategic planning boxes yeah. and the yeah. and the um, senior community boxes. Yeah. Some of the tenets of that that yeah. we're looking to work on. But how do we form form a new committee? So how we, do we f officially form a new committee? Is what we would need to take the next so we steps would on. Take most of what's here and just put it in the format with particular slots yeah, for sure. membership. Sure. Um, bring it to the next meeting for the board to have the board vote to establish the committee and then we would advertise for members. Is the board yeah. all uh, on board for that? No, but yeah. my only comment would be maybe have the appointing of the residents through the town administrator's office so that he can, so they can screen based on expertise that can, they can bring to the table, you know, rather than my next door neighbor who may have some expertise but may not, you know, uh, rather than <laughs> keep it more apolitical and that way it may be able to function okay. a little bit better sometimes. And uh, so just like he has many other appointments, like recreation committee and other uh, committee board of health, things like that. He makes the appointments. Um, and I think he can draw from the application pool and pick the one that's best suited for the current needs, which is let's establish something that's gonna be up and get it up and running and, and going and then uh, going forward. I think that's fine because the, the, the committee would be coming back to the board anyway for review of things or recommendations. So. Right. Yeah. I, I just think yeah. sometimes it's more centrally located there as you know, people sure. can come and go. Sure. And, it's, and then we forget yeah. to solicit the forms and everything else like that. We forget what we're voting on. So that's the only thing I would. Okay. Yeah, I think Are I we all in agreement to. with that? I am. Right. Yeah. I think, sure. and then the public service director would have a major role in it because a lot right. of. It, People that are affected fall under her. Yes, under of her, course, her of course. So yes. It'd be a nice time Great. To all together. Sounds good. Does she all right. Add, I just, I think uh, Ms. Hartman's on the line. Does she want to add anything to that? Uh, she wrote me a yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I just want to thank you uh, for Ms. Hartman. of this issue and say that I look forward to supporting the committee as a staff liaison, um, as well as, you know, working administratively with our uh, town staff on the issue. Uh, in addition to what the committee can offer. I really look forward to local residents stepping up if they have expertise in transportation to helping advise for the community's future. 
Can I just add one thing? Uh, so we, uh, uh, Ms. Hartman and I, sat through an MVRTA meeting last week, and Michael was there for a little bit as well. And I have to say, her understanding of this is very, very high. So <laughs> already, I feel very confident that she's the right person in the right position, because she was given, they want to change their service levels and standardize them, which, you know, would be an effect of the town. And she was on it right away, knowing what that meant. So uh, great. we have a great leader taking right out of the shoe. It's something that I couldn't do, you know, honestly couldn't do. Okay, so we'll look right. for this the next in meeting. the next meeting to great. be able to enact it. Or right. That sounds great. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. All right, next order of business, legal bills. I don't know, Mr. Gilberto, are these all for the secondary school? They, they are all related to the secondary school building committee project. Um, there's, a, there's a detailed invoice that's in the packet for uh, consideration by the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there, there is also a motion. Yeah, can we do the motion first? Yeah. Yep. Madam Chair, I move to approve the invoice 11426 in the amount of $143,739 to Furman Gregory de Deptula <laughs> for legal services for the secondary school building project litigation. Second. It's a motion by Mr. Walner, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? I mean, other than. Is it, is it, is it just over? Just, well, I would have said something different. I had actually connected with Mr. Gilberto on multiple facets of this billing yeah. to ask Mr. B Gilberto to go back. I, I can state them here publicly if if I mean, I'm need be, quickly. but... I haven't had time. I'm just looking quickly and some of Oh, I, I looked yeah. more... I'm really questioning. I looked more ardently than I typically do, and I saw some things that were really... Yeah. Some some red flags, yeah. um, particularly given the communications at the uh, phase of mediation. And Is there a big deal with delay, just to look at it more? I don't uh, no, I, I it's our vote it. whether or not to approve it. I, I, so I, mean, that's I, our I took a look at it too, and I guess it's it's higher than what I anticipated it to be. However, you know, in looking at the details of it, I don't have, I couldn't come up with any specific issues that I would have disagreed with necessarily. I mean, he stated there were a couple of oversights with some of the expert witnesses and billings that had taken place, so that's being corrected and you know needs to be paid. Um, he had uh, an associate counsel that was part of his firm, and they moved to another firm, but. We were approached with that and said that we didn't want to contract with him and that he was to do that and bill us directly. We didn't want to deal with that. And that's what it was. And it seemed to be at the same rate that he was being billed out when he was with the firm. Um, I just know through all the communications in the last three or four weeks of, you know, during the mediation and subsequent to the mediation was taking place, um, there were a lot of conversation, a lot of work that went into getting this settled. So um, it appears as though this is pretty much it will be done with it. Yeah, but that's precisely why I had issues with the billing. What's that? It, it appeared that there was a, quite a bit of trial preparation being done. Yeah, that's what that, I think. And we also had billing for that that we've approved, approved twice over. And the expert billing was another thing that I had an issue yeah, as far on. As, and the secondary billing from the yeah, other as individual. As far as the, the additional preparation that needed to be done to get ready for trial, we had that in a state of flux and we're still moving forward. We had no oh, no, no, it no, wasn't. No, no. The trial no, no. was postponed. <laughs> no, it wasn't postponed. Yes, no, it, it was. wasn't postponed until the end of this month, until yeah. next week. Yeah. It was postponed until the 24th of October. Right. And we didn't give our council any definitive, we gave them definitive instructions as to what we needed to get to in order to settle. In the meantime, the work didn't stop it. The, the, the trial was not postponed, it was put up till October 24th, and so you still had to continue to prepare in case we are the other side. I totally and, disagree okay, with that. Okay, well, you can analysis. disagree, but I mean, I'm not going to reveal the executive session oh, know, stuff until we actually for, vote to yeah. release it. It's in a state of minutes, flux for three but, weeks. And those are three critical weeks yeah. as far as being ready for, for trial and not being ready for trial. We weren't sure. Well, some I of wasn't the billing, sure until we got some, the phone call. Some of the itemizations the are pretty questionable, yeah. and I that's what I spoke yeah. with Mr. Gilberto about going back to 
the attorney on the billing that's what the specific items that we're being billed for and it looks like we're being billed twice over for some of these some of these same items so from a second counsel so um, but it's it's a motion and a second on the floor if, you, if the board wants to you know take a vote on it we can call to a vote mr Wong? so i'm just saying have we thoroughly investigated the bill and are we satisfied that what they what you see is correct or do we need more time before i, I know you i saw some letters go back and forth or whatever I, I more just want to make sure the board members you know sorry i know i forwarded it to you madam chair and it's in the share file folder i, I did pose the questions that we discussed to attorney dip tool and he provided responses um you know a, a couple of the issues specifically the that you're trying to untangle the timing of the trial prep i think i think one of the problems was there was certainly trial prep happening for a third time even before That's the a huge deadline problem, yes. even before the date <laughs> that we're talking about and, yes. and so I, I you know whether how we handle that i mean there were, there were certainly hours that were put in and, and, and were worked whether they should have been worked or not I, I, it's hard for me to give you a, a great answer the, the issue of when the trial was going to go forward did linger into August. So that's why it spilled into August, including there was a meeting that happened out of state, which concerned both the chair and I when we were trying to figure out the timing. But when I go to untangle when the trial was actually postponed, um, it was in the middle of August that that, that, that happened. Um, so uh, th those aren't great answers, but those are the answers that I, that I got. Um, you know, I no, but we you, all know that timeline. Yeah. So. That's why it's questionable. The, the other thing I would just say is I did check to see, you know, when before there was a change in the employment of the second counsel and it, you know, what happened and we were being billed for that person's time. Um, there wasn't a separate agreement. That person worked for the firm. The hours were coming through and being billed and they were billed again this time during the settlement discussions and the final trial prep. They were discounted as well, um, which is consistent with what happened previously um, as much as we may not have, have liked that. So. That's what I can provide you for, for information. Well, we like the discount. We'd spend the 20% discount would take. <laughs> and is this it? I mean, is this it? Are we, I, 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 this, this, is, this is likely to be it. Um, I can't, I, I don't look, I don't want to tell I you know. that there won't be another bill that's forthcoming. And we have a jams bill, the mediator that we need to pay still to. Sell to. I haven't received that bill yet. Um, so those are the two, the, you know, that, that is definitely outstanding. I think we're unlikely to have anything Further from Attorney Tula, but I don't want to sit here and well, promise uh, that. Other than the signing of the whatever the final agreement is, I yeah. mean, that's already been. I, I think that's been built here. That's, that's, that's all uh, set. From what I saw, many it, entries it, for that. It looks like all of that has happened. Now again, he needs to file something with the court. I, I didn't see whether that actually happened or not. I thought he filed um, that. He, he filed for dismissal. Or maybe even more pro bono on that. Once one. once we signed on, he filed for dismissal. Yeah, I had to. I and there's an awful him. lot of entries relating to that time frame when he. He was moving forward with the direction of the board where I got communications by an individual who f said that he wasn't, had no idea what was going on yet. We've got multiple entries from two attorneys billing for multiple communications from back and forth, more communications than the, Mr. Gilberto has had with attorney Deptula. So there's a lot of questionable entries here, at least, you know, from my, from my perspective. So, and also we did, we did already have front loading of the expert costs and that's, those are two massive bills for a list of experts. Yeah. So, um, so I did have a lot of questions with regard to the billing. We've gone for, this far, on the deferred of, of to investigate it or just I, to get a better response. I don't know. I, I, just I didn't it. read the response. When did he respond to it? It was that? late this afternoon, I think. Oh, I just did like I, I don't know if everyone else had a chance to read it. that. I saw that there was a response. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't understand the questions, so I couldn't really relate to the issues. So I, mean, I just knew that he, he wrote like three pages. Or it was three pages. He's going to kill him if he waits two weeks to get paid. I mean, he looked like he was doing okay. I saw his rollers. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know whether it's going to kill him or not to, to do that. I, I would. I would hope not. Um, I, I I mean I I think it's worth giving a little, a little more review given the direction that was given. Uh, I, I don't I don't think I'm going to be able to find out much more than what's in the letter. But if okay. folks have not had the opportunity that. to read the yeah. letter, yeah. I think you should take the time to read it. Okay. Well, there's a motion by Mr. Walner and a second. All those in favor. Aye. All those. Oh. Up, so. 
Two, all those opposed. The three of us, I guess. We'll do a roll call. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary's and I, Mr. Walner. You can't discuss it. <laughs> Mr. Walner has litigation fatigue, is what we call it. <laughs> yeah. We all really. have that. He's tired of the topic. Mr. Walner, you're in favor that of paying like pay it. Finish. I'm going to say no. Yeah. Mrs. No. Mr. No. Studo and I'm a no, so motion does not carry. And so we'll, we're going to need some more information. I would ask the board about, uh, take a look at what he provided back, and if there are okay. further questions, give them, give them to me, please. Okay. Yes. Minutes. Minutes. I just this. Next. I just said it's a note for board members who may not have had the opportunity. There is a Thank new you. folder in share file okay. where there are many draft minutes um, pending. And I would just ask the board members if you have not had the opportunity. I have not. To please do that. I wasn't going to single anybody out. Um, so. It's entitled meeting minutes, <laughs> parentheses, drafts. Like you want me to look at it now? No, no. So we'll, we'll try to come with motions for what's in there at the next meeting. Thank but if you have you. issues with what you see in there, try to get them to right. us in the next two weeks or right. so if possible. Okay, I'll take a look at it Thank before you. I am. Uh, we do, it does not require a vote tonight. No. And just and just for just for Sorry. the board's edification, well, we can send our changes to Mrs. McNeil, and she'll track them so the rest of us can see where be, where these issues are. Because sometimes we talk over mm -hmm. one another a no. lot of the time. We do. <laughs> When I say we, I mean you and me. So sometimes it you doesn't quite get reported the way that it goes. Do your track changes goes. in that file? If you're reading it, do your track changes. If each one of you will be a different color, and I'll see what, okay. what it says. Yeah. So That's you great. make those changes in that share file. And then, because I have like the permanent drafts, if you're going to, we can communicate through that. Okay. So in other words, just send, don't send them to all of us. Send them directly to Mrs. Yeah. McDeal right. if you have any changes. No. But it's more to give us the yeah, this is our yeah, final just, yes, reminder. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're not doing this is our final we're reminder. Out. We're gonna we're gonna we didn't intend you to vote. All right, I'm gonna yeah. look at it. <laughs> we really need it this time. <laughs> That's right. All right, thank you. Okay, board member reports. Mr. Kilbert, uh, Mr. O'Leary. Uh because we had the town administrator, yeah. unless there's anything else. All right, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> uh, just a couple of things. One uh, this past week, uh, uh probably one of the sweetest, most kind, and uh, devoted public employees pa passed away, Eleanor Jean, who was the assistant town clerk for a, a number of years uh, here at Town Hall, we retired you know, several years ago. Right? But anyway, she passed away this week, and I just thought it was important to mention that uh, her service to the, to the town was uh, fantastic, and again, one of the sweetest and uh, helpful individuals I have ever come across in Town Hall. And, uh, you know, uh, we were fortunate to have her here for so long, and uh, our condolences to her family. The only other thing is um, get ready to vote. Vote early. You know, the opportunities are here. The town clerk was here this evening. The opportunities are uh, nearly endless. So uh, participate. There's an awful lot riding on this uh, ballot this year, uh, not just candidates, but questions. And uh, I urge everybody to participate because they're, they're making it very easy, and that's a, that's a good thing. So please do. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Eller and Mr. Waller. All right, just briefly, um, the uh, Martin's Pond Committee, there's been blockage up there when we came to Culvert. They've been working with DPW to, and to get that opened up along with Wilmington. And so, Wilmington is going to make some effort to open it up. Because when it backs up, if we have another rainstorm, we would actually start to flood through these properties. So, um, good job of DPW and the Martin's Pond Committee for working on that together. Digging up old data about how that works because Wilmington wasn't even aware of themselves. And once we be, they became aware, they helped us out. So that's good. They're planning to come here in November to talk to us about the dredging of the pond and what that's all about. So oh, okay. they're going to give a little, they're also going to give a, a water quality report to you that we recently received. So you can have a view of that as well. So they're they're making progress. And on the recycle committee, they've been. I don't know if you've been noticing they've been transcript, they've been trying to get the word out about the November 1 changes that are coming up. I don't think anybody's really paying attention with all the trash stuff going on, but they're they're following their schedule to get their word out as much as possible. So uh, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then I already mentioned about the Commission on Disabilities. I just have a great group who are just working so well together. Can't believe how much progress we're making with this seriously. So it's really nice to see that group start from nothing. 
and become, you know, they're actually they're just sensational people in the group. We're bringing professionals who are helping us out, and it's really uh, it's a great thing to be involved with. I love starting a new group and having it be uh, kind of be impactful for the ones that are very impactful. And the 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 the, the uh, motto, the um, the tagline is choose to include. It's a great it's a great uh, little tagline. I didn't think of somebody else That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez? I'm hopefully going to get through this without choking. And oh, no. for everybody's knowledge, I get tested every week for COVID at work. So. You get tested for COVID every week? I do. Said, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, community impact team is having a free drug disposal drive through. That will be held Saturday, October 29th at the Senior Center from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, so clean up your cabinets if you want to get rid of some of that stuff. And they take pet meds as well. Um, EDC, um, Keep It On the Development Committee, is planning an evening event on November 9th at 5.30 at the Hillview. So, which is kind of nice because everyone wants to get in there and See how it's looking. Um, it's similar to the networking events they've had annually in the past, but this one will have a special focus on educating the business community about the SOAR project and upcoming special town meeting. Um, consultants will be having presenting a workshop on October 25th at the library <coughs> in the morning. Um, but this event will have the social component of previous recept EDC receptions. Appetizers will be served and there'll be a cash buy. So just a heads up for that for everybody. Veterans Events Committee. Um, we have the Tuxbury Country Club again, which is graciously donated by Mark Ginsburg and the Tuxbury Country Club. Um, the Veterans Events Committee has is we're, we're actually having a meeting tomorrow night to nail down all our plans, but um, it will be from five to nine. The doors open at four at the Tuxbury Country Club. Um, tickets are available. There's a phone number you can call 978-357-5211, or you could probably get a hold of um, Sue Magna. Um, it's just a great event. If, if people haven't gone to it, it's free. Um, and it's just a, a really great event that they do for our veterans every year. Um, also, we're putting together the plans for Veterans Day. Um, but we are also including into the, that event the um, Purple Hot Community that we're judging from. So that will be incorporated into it. So we'll talk more about that when we go to the next meeting. But, um, yeah, so all of that's going on. Thank you. Mr. Studo. Everything that I would report now gets talked about every other day with SOAR. Right. So everybody's heard the report. How Just about the next meeting? The next meeting is tomorrow, which uh, I know Mr. O'Leary and uh, uh, I can attend, I cannot, and uh, but that is for the specific more for the abutters mm -hmm. um, on the route itself. Of course, you know, everyone's welcome, but that's the the next one, and then uh, you know, this Gonzalez so, reference. So the distance learning lab at the, Correct. At the high school tomorrow, yes. uh, nine. seven o'clock, seven. seven, and then there is um. The, the next one will be at, I believe, 8 a.m. the following yeah. Tuesday, as you referenced. So. And the UTC event. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I also, again, want to thank Michael and Mr. Mr. Gilberto, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Studo, because it's such a huge investment of your time to help carry that forward for us. And it's, it is gonna remain a huge investment of your time. And I think both of you have spoken about the importance of really all five of us 
helping to try to bring people to the table to the town meeting because it's such a crucial, important issue for us moving forward as a town um, to to get see this through to fruition. And we finally, like Mr. O'Leary said at the town meeting, we're finally close to that point of being able to move the town a little bit, not a little bit, but a lot further. And, and it's not without a heavy, heavy investment of your time to get this done. So, and of course, Mr. Clark and the team, but uh, primarily you've been the vocal proponents of this on, on behalf of the town. So it's, we really appreciate the time that's involved. And we know it's significant. Yeah, it's, a, it's a huge investment that we're asking people to, to consider. Um, it, it's, what we're, all we're trying to do is get the information out there. We're not yes. trying to sway one way or the other. And we're stressing that and, and telling everybody at the board, just watch your input. You know, so right. before we make these critical decisions, you know, we're doing it with the input. And, uh, you know, it's starting to grow. The awareness is starting to grow, but it's still not we're nowhere near where it needs to be. So again, we're asking everybody to, to get involved and reach out. And, and again, Joe Parisi is doing yeoman's work. Oh, you're right. so crazy, I forgot. I'm telling you, yes. he's done a yeah. fantastic job and a huge investment of time and resources yeah. and uh, sacrifice on his part. And uh, it shouldn't go unmentioned at all. Right. Not to mention the town administrator was yeah. always in there too. Uh, but, but Joe's really worked very hard on this and uh, okay. trying to corral all the parties, not easy. Right, and just getting out to all the different... And, and again, and, and I know we, our demands are... The demands on us have been great, but if you, any of the other colleagues here, other Mr. Studo and I, if you have an opportunity to come to one of these, it's important for you to hear the first hand too, and some of the concerns, and we can tell you and fill you in, but it's, uh, it's also it's important. It it, it's like also see important for the community to see you there, you know, yeah. like anything, yeah. right? Because it just, it's a, again, it, it just, it just shows that, you know, we're all, and again, I'm not, I don't know where anyone stands and I'm pretty confident. I know where Mr. O'Leary stands, but I talked <laughs> to him a little bit about this. So, um, but you know, so I think that's important. And, and again, it's a heavy, I wasn't here for the school vote, but I imagine that everybody got involved at some point, including select board, which kind of really didn't spearhead it, right? Kind of, you know, it was a, no, so, but this one, yeah. Well, we don't want to, we don't want to. That's a, that was a whole separate thing. Yeah. We want, we just, this is really something totally different than what happened with the, you talk about the two overrides with the school. We don't really yeah. want, we, we're, we're, we're hopefully done with that one and moving on with this one. Because this one is really a, another forward thinking type of thing. Right. And the other thing I wanted to mention, but I just wanted to say thank you because I know the tremendous amount of time you're investing in it and you're doing it as volunteers and that i think sh you know is is a <laughs> you don't have to but you want to because you're invested in the town so i hope that other people can um also draw some people out for this issue at the town meeting and um i want to just let everybody know if there's anyone still listening to us besides ourselves that um there's <laughs> going to be a haunted playground mm -hmm. october 22nd at the batch elder it's an outdoor fun uh playground family friendly type of an event from five to nine the rain date is october 23rd if that doesn't happen but there's a lot of do local businesses donating, sponsoring. There's a lot of, uh, you know, students and parents working on the event. It's an annual thing that the North Reading Maskers puts on for the, um, for the, um, the town. And it's all, it's great fun if you have kids and even if you don't have kids and you just want to come by and have a little bit of something to eat and a little, a little fun. It's a, it's a good time. A lot of fun. So join the maskers for their haunted playground at the Batch Elder. Saturday from five to nine. Something fun to do. Everything bad, boo bash. Uh, bash yeah. When my kids were young, it was at Martin Farm. Yeah. Yes. 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 It was so really much fun. Place. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No yeah. problem, right? 
Can I just add one thing on too before we Sure. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, sewer is very important, but we have to recognize that when we start talking about adding on $600, $600, onto someone's property where they're older and senior, we're pushing them out the door. And it's a real stress for them, right? So CTC on November 1 is going to have a meeting about the accessory dwelling unit policy in town. And so that would be a good chance for us, because I think that's the most practical uh, realistic thing we can do quickly to keep people in town. Um, and and so Jerry Noel is going to be there. I'm going to be there. You're the liaison. I think you'll be there. If other people show that, because this has been dragging on for a long time, the stressor dwelling unit policies have been created all over the country. It's not that we have to reinvent anything. But offering that as a token, you know, potentially if we could even line up that there's a promise of that coming up in December, it would be a nice way to say there's a potential answer for people to stay in town, especially when they're feeling squeezed. And this benefits the senior community specifically. So, um, you know, so you can come on November 1st at 730. That'd be great because we're going to have that. That's part of our pitch for the sewerage too is, you know, a study showed, you know, additional housing. And again, this age in place, the age friendly community. <coughs> You know, what we're looking for here is an opportunity to, to grow the housing stock here along this district, which will allow people to, who are overhoused now, to downsize, stay in the community, and then that can all be handled through zoning and development and partnering with people to get it handled appropriately to meet the needs of the community and allow people to each share in place. And again, grow the population a bit to help support local businesses and community economic, it's all dovetails together. Yeah. And uh, that's part of our pitch. Yeah, good. Well, I want to talk to you about that. Afterwards. In 25 years, <laughs> I do it outside. You get the idea, right? So we, we need that assessment growing unit policy. That's practical. It's fine. I don't care. I'm all in that. Okay. So I'm encouraging people to do it. Okay. That's and awesome. I, I think, too, I think the doing the frequently asked questions is great because I think it has to be a way that we can all understand the data. That data is a little bit complex. It is and a I, lot of stuff. It is a lot of stuff, but I think the bottom line is. Residents want to know where is it going, when is it going, and how much is it going to cost, and how much am I going to have to pay for it? Right. If I'm on the line or if I'm not on the line, right. what's the cost going to be? But then how's the town going to pay for it, yeah. too? I mean, where are, we, where are we getting that money to pay for it? And I I think that, that what's the benefit is the other thing I'm hearing. Well, it only benefits the people on the line. Not really, but we, we're not doing, I think we need to work on conveying the economic benefit to the entire town and the fact that we've never been able to go to a different classification tax-wise because right. we don't have anything to offer. You and I are thinking the same thing because I wrote down the same thing. Oh. The benefits page, you know how we talked about with these the school um, litigation, give us the bullet points and repeat it yes. over and over again? Yeah. This is all I see for bullet points from the slides. I didn't see the split. Class That's going to change. We're at, we, we, we thought of the same thing. Okay. We, we so, started thinking about this. But again, we did it methodically because we wanted to first throw out the... Everything. We're not trying to bury this thing. No, Don't understand. worry about it, right? We're try, but now that we gave like the so-called the cost, it's the, the benefits coming. I think we're going to outline... I would give that. If you're going to give the cost, give the benefit at the same time. You don't want a crescendo... No, no, you don't have time for that. <laughs> you need to get that benefit out because people are just asking, I'm spending this money, I don't, I'm not really going to get anything for it. And I know we're not fully, fully finished exploring the funding of it. And I know really we, this is probably dialogue for another agenda item, but is there, is there a thought towards similar to what some communities do with lead line replacement where they could do a zero interest loan out of some of the some of the extra funds that we have or something like that to, for people to help in contribute towards it, even though that's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, as yeah. they say, but just for those that are financially strapped yeah. to be able to, because I, I do see the benefit to a household tying in because it's, it's a benefit like we've talked about, about different possibilities for, sale value uh, yeah. from sale value to developmental value to even adding an addition on or an accessory dwelling on and that type of thing so there's a huge obviously huge economic benefit to 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 be able to tie in but you know th maybe there's some creative ways that that might be available to help 
to help some households with that. Just that's just not a doable amount. Yeah. Again, it might seem insignificant, but not to some households. It's not some to some households. It's really significant. So. Yeah. Yeah, so sure I don't know. Time. I know that's not the thing that we can decide right no, now. No, we could be here till one. I know. Well, so, At so, least. but anyway, thank you for that, All and right. um, we'll, right. we look forward to more discussion on it. And do you have to post if more than two of you? No, because we won't be deliberating. We're not going to discuss it. We'll we're just be there. Input. There will be no decisions made. There's no deliberation taking place. So all five of us could be there. Wouldn't have to be posted. So we would be able to sit in, but we just wouldn't be able to contribute to the dialogue. Yeah, or the, the, my understanding is that the chair recognizes you can certainly. You can ask a question like you're. Yeah, it's so though you're a citizen participant, but you can't really talk about. You but know, if I say something, so you can't argue with me. <laughs> right. Yes, I can. No, you can argue through the chair, right, but you so. can't argue. You can't. You can argue through the chair, but you can't argue. <laughs> so, well, we're getting over. Right, yeah. I'm just making no, no, it. No, no, that's, that's why I'm encouraging you. If any of you, the rest of the three yeah. are available, please make yourself available and come because it's important. First of all, to be seen, uh, but also to hear it firsthand. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, like it's it. a lot of it's material. A, I have yeah. a meeting tomorrow night, yeah. but I'll be at the, the business one. Tuesday morning one. Yeah. And then obviously. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Second. A motion by Mr. Wallen, a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous.